difference in political world because they know practically that keeping the church open is their best interest. They know it experientially. It's not a theoretical statement. So God is raising a new breed, a new generation. And that's why for me, you know, when, when, when this topic was given to me to minister, I was like, God, what? this is, as far as I was like, this is the mystery of mysteries in Bible. To explore the Trinity, the Godhead. But one of the things that, that, that struck me so strongly was that a, a generation of people have to be raised who know God. We must know God. We have to know them. So that's why God is taking this time to invest this series of teachings and everything we're going through in this, in this school to ensure that we are properly baked with the knowledge of God. Because a time will come where if the knowledge that we claim to have of God cannot, does not translate to practical witness, practical witness. Because Bible says the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all nations for a witness, not for awareness. For a witness. That means, and then, he said, this gospel of the kingdom, he said, and then the end will come. So we know what will cause the end to happen. The end is not going to jump on us. Something must happen that will trigger the end. And it is the preaching of this gospel of the kingdom for a witness, not for awareness. That you are aware of the gospel doesn't mean you have seen the witness of the gospel. And that means that on the face of the earth and the nations of the world, the Lord is going to practically show all nations what the gospel or what the kingdom of God literally looks like. Amen. When men have seen that, then it will be just of God to say, I can come now and then I can wrap things up. Because now you know what the kingdom of God looks like. And I have planted emissaries. I have planted witnesses in the nations of the earth. People who have been cultured by the gospel of the kingdom, who have become a reproduction of the kingdom of God in every nation of the earth. So that when you are looking at this man, you cannot say that Jesus is not the son of God. You cannot say it. Jesus said that, I pray that the church may be perfect. Let me know that this, this, this thing is becoming strong. Let me just teach. Amen. Because I'm saying this to understand why we must sit down and learn their persons. Why we must know God. We have to. Because they that know their gods have been strong. Ah, the kind of darkness on the earth now is not, is not, is not a kind of darkness that you will be speaking English to. No, no. There have to be witnesses. And you serve in power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you will be witnesses. Oh, so the reason we carry the Holy Ghost is to make us witnesses, living proofs that Jesus is on the ground. The, the world doesn't yet have so much of a view of such kind of witness. Not that they are, don't get me wrong. But a generation is arising on this earth that will show the world, not just by speaking English, they will show the world the reality of the government of God. This gospel of the kingdom was it please. That's why I usually say if we are preparing for the Lord's coming, the true way to prepare the Lord for the Lord's coming is to prepare yourself for that coming. The question you ask yourself is, as, as the church of Jesus, in what capacity is Jesus coming back for the church? Jesus is coming back as a bridegroom for the church, right? So if Jesus comes back as a bridegroom for the church, then you are supposedly preparing for him, then what should you be preparing yourself to be? A bride. Have you? Now, the Bible makes us know that Jesus will not come for a church that has spot a ring. He's coming for a spotless bride. Then, that's on the one hand, or that's the negative side, what the church doesn't have. No spot, no wrinkle, any sort of thing. Then what does the church have? He said, holy and blameless. Oh. Now, to be holy and blameless is much more than you don't sin. Now, of course, you cannot be holy and blameless if you are sin. There's no doubt about that. That is fundamental. But it's much more than that because God does not sin and is holy. So the question is, what is God? That thing that he is must become reproduced in the people. And people are rising on the earth who think like God, who talk like God. Who act like God? Who look like God? So it's much more than you are not sinning. You are not sinning. That's what you are not doing. But what are you doing? What is the description of a life that looks like God? What is the description of a people that behave like God? What is the description of a people that think and talk like God? That kind of people are the people he's coming for. So you can see there's a long way to go. 
That's what the Bible says. He gave apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers for the purpose of equipping the saints for the work of ministry so that the body of Christ will be edified till we all come and attain to the unity that is the result of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man who's, who is defined by a certain stature called the fullness of Christ. So that we no more be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, you know, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth, the Lord may grow up to Christ, to Him who is the head in all things, even Christ. So there's a growing up to do before there's a going up. So we can't just be passively waiting for the rapture. Lord, let the rapture. It will happen. The Bible says we are children of the day that the seasons of His coming we will know. It shouldn't catch us unawares. The coming of Jesus will not catch us unawares. Because we are, it's what we are preparing ourselves for. Things are going to change, though. Ah, things will change. I, I'm just, this is, this is good news. You know, the gospel is not good news. This is, I'm just announcing good news. That God has determined to take a generation and make sure that the travail of Jesus' is soul is able to get it in the generation. So I'm saying this to encourage us that we should take this, this opportunity and whatever opportunities we have to just sit at the feet of Jesus and learn his ways and, and, and learn about his presence and understand the things that pertain to him very, very seriously because we are in a season where that knowledge of God will be required to bear witness to the world, to convince a world that Jesus is the Son of God. It's going to take more than just, I mean, no, there's technology now, so it, it, it's going to take more than just, just being able to speak and be able to put some things together and arrange some things. This is more than management and organization. A people have to arise who are literal reproductions of Jesus in every nation of the earth. When, anytime I see this, they say, I want to see this in my day. That in every nation on the earth, you can point to men and say you are evidences that Jesus is alive. In every nation. So there is no question as to whether God sent Jesus to save the world. At that point, then God will be just to now say, okay, if you don't, if you now refuse God, refuse Jesus, then he can send a strong delusion and you will be living life. And the Antichrist can arise and do whatever he wants to do. Because God has been justified by bringing a people to show you what his kingdom looks like. Not just to say it, but to show it. To show it. So to that end, let us appreciate these times where we are sitting down and just spending time to, 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 to take in the knowledge of God. I know the majority of these meetings will be teachings and all, this, all those things. And those things are very important because the saints have to be established by teaching. So it's important that we go through the, this process and learn everything I want to do. Some of us are already ministers, we're already blazing the training, they are different places. So I believe that this is just something to strengthen us to, 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 to put more fire inside us as it were. Because the knowledge of God makes us able to do this exploit. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Alright, so I'm supposed to so I've been um, asked by God's servant to, to deal with the matter of the Trinity. Now, I title this the mystery of the Trinity because the Trinity, it does have what it actually is. The Trinity is a mystery. It's a mystery because it's, it, 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 we are never going to fully understand it. Even in heaven, we still, you know, in heaven, we still be knowing God. Yes, it's, it's going to be, it, we are going to just be exploring the depths. The Bible says the depths of the wisdom and knowledge and understanding of God, they are unsearchable. So, we are always going to have to be, by the Spirit of God, exploring and unraveling. And for me, this is the blessing of Christianity. The blessing of Christianity is the knowledge of God. What, what Jesus has brought to us is God he has given us the, the platform, the access to be able to know the true God. That's what Christianity is about. And I, if God permits me, I've got else we'll get there. So, it's a mystery. The Trinity is a mystery. But it's a mystery nonetheless that God has desired and has decided to give us access to because that's who he is. Do we understand that? That's who God is. So because that's who he is and the whole call of Christianity is to know God, then he has to reveal himself to us as he is. So no matter how unquote, complex it might seem, we have to sit with God and, and learn him because he has given us the blessed privilege of coming to know him. Praise God. I also came with uh, my brother, uh, Stephen. He's a wonderful brother. Amen. Praise God.
that the Trinity is a mystery. So just establish the fact that the Trinity is a mystery and that God has invited us, though it's a mystery, God has invited us to come into the knowledge of this mystery because God wants us to know him. Amen. Amen. Don't forget, God wants us to know him. And since the Trinity is what he is and he wants us to know him, then he has given us the access and the grace to partake of the knowledge of this mystery of the Trinity, because this is what he is. Amen. It's what he is. Oh, well, we call to him. Amen. So this is not just a matter of theological debate and all that. And uh, by those means, I'm coming from a perspective that may not quite, but I trust God to help me, and I, I trust that you'll be blessed from this perspective. Because it's not just a matter of theologically debating whether God is you know, three in one, this and it's not about that. The Trinity can be known experientially. You can know the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost experientially. So if it's not, you will know that ah, this is the Father, this is the Son, this is the Holy Ghost. They can be known. And that's the whole point of this. So not just to fill our heads with just more information, but to give us a platform for experiencing the true God in the reality of the eternity. To experience them without capacity. Because there are things within the prerogative of the Father, there are things within the prerogative of the Son, there are things within the prerogative of the Holy Ghost. These are things we're going to enter into as we, as we explore this mystery. Amen. Amen. Alright, so the first thing we want to talk about here, so we want to establish the reality of the Trinity. That the, the matter of the Trinity, though it's a mystery, is not a figment of human imagination. It's not a product of human romanticization. You know, trying to probe me into Zeus and all those, you know, those Greek mythology and Roman mythology. No, 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 this, this is not a matter of human brains with demonic spirits trying to conjure something No, The Trinity is a reality. Please, what did I say? The Trinity is a reality. So the first thing I want to say is that the matter of the Trinity is clearly established in the scriptures. Now, this is important because the scriptures are the document of the truth of God as he has revealed himself ultimately to man and they are the standard by which we define what is true. So any revelation that you cannot find in scripture is possible. Any revelation you can't find in scripture is possible. The scripture gives us the boundaries and the context within which we are supposed to explore God. Now, let me, let me just back up a bit. When God revealed, when, when God started with man, there was no scripture. Creation was God's Bible. So Adam was walking with God in the garden with trees and all that. And in the context of his walk with God and interaction with God, he will begin to know God as he was walking with God in that garden, interacting with creation and all that. And that's why if you see in the book of Romans chapter 1, the first revelation of God, according to Romans chapter 1, is that God first of all revealed himself to man in creation. But man rejected that revelation. And then he produced idolatry. And then God said, okay, let me now review myself in the law. And that's where the scripture began. Because scripture begins as with Moses. Although we are told that the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. But if you see the other way scriptures are placed, and beginning from Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, he expounded. So Moses is the beginning, as it were. Amen. And then after doing the law, and the law didn't quite achieve what he wanted to achieve, but he prepared the way, then he finally revealed himself to us in the gospel. So these are the three. The three instruments or the, the three interfaces of the, of the revelation of God to humanity. Creation, the law, and the gospel. Now these three things are captured in the scripture. The scriptures. So the scriptures, so there was a time God was in, there was no scripture. Abraham did not have the scriptures. He walked with God. And so God wants to preach to him the gospel. God looks to the stars as if he wants to count the stars. Because what fall into the fabric of creation is the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's there. Because all things were created by Jesus and for Jesus. Colossians 1 verse 16. So everything is speaking of Jesus. So God will come down, say, count the stars, the sun on the shore, and begin to talk, God begins to talk to Job and say, do you understand when I made this and when I made that? And, he's, and when Job finishes that experience, Job said, I have heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now I see you with my eyes. In that whole panoramic exposition by God, revelation by 
by God of himself through creation, Job was able to see God. And for those who have eyes to see, when you see a beautiful sunset or a beautiful sunrise, when you look at the beauty, the beauty of a child who is just born, you find that in creation, God is revealing himself. But you see, God didn't stop there because God doesn't want a matter that is left to subjective experience. So God needed that there will be objective boundaries and objective definitions of his truth that are independent of your feelings, independent of your experiences, objective reality. And so what he did was to anoint men in the Old Testament and in the New Testament to bring forth what is called his oracles. So the scriptures are the compendium of the oracles of God. Can you say that after me? Yes. They are the compendium of the oracles of God, within which we are to experience, know, and discover God. So once the scriptures came on board, the standard became higher. So you cannot now say, well, the, the, the first guy is here, by which I let's just walk with God anyhow. My walk, no, 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 no. We can measure whether your work is accurate or not by scripture now. There's something to define whether you're doing right or wrong. There's now there's something. So every revelation, every teaching, every truth of God, according to God's revelation, must be found in scripture. It must be found in scripture. If it is not found, and I'm going to say scripture. Okay, let's leave that, because that's another thing. Because the scripture has a spirit. And the spirit, the testimony in the scripture is Jesus Christ. Because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And the, the scripture, and I'm going to say this, the scripture is not a poetic book, even though there's poetry in it. The scripture is not a, it's not moral instruction. Even though there are instructions in it. The scripture is not a self-help book or a motivational book. Even though you can be motivated and you can be helped greatly from the scriptures. That's not what it is. The scripture is a prophetic document. The scripture was put together by what they call the spirit of prophecy. So this scripture is prophecy. And prophecy doesn't just say, just say, Lord, tomorrow this will happen. No. Prophecy is that acting. Oh my God. Jesus can only be revealed by the spirit of prophecy. So the essence of the spirit of prophecy is for the is the purpose of revealing Jesus so that God can be discovered in Jesus. That's why I said worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So that make you see that. That's why the scripture cannot be understood just by the fact that you have a mental capacity. You can understand Greek and Hebrew so you understand the scriptures. Not necessarily so. You need the spirit of prophecy who is the Holy Ghost, to be able to unravel the document that the scripture is. That's why they are, you can be a fantastic theologian and you may not know God. Jesus looked at people in his days, fantastic theologians, Pharisees and Sadducees. These were people, custodians of the books. And Jesus said, you err, not knowing the scriptures. Uh -uh. These were people that when they heard consulted, where would the Messiah be born? They said, ah, written, ah, that Bethlehem of Judah, this and this and they gave it to him straight. They didn't have to consult anything. They knew this thing of hand. Yeah, Jesus said, you don't know the scriptures. Uh -uh. How do you tell people they don't know the scriptures? These are people who, you know, one of the reasons why they were angry or why they, they didn't quite understand Jesus. He never learned. Jesus never sat at the feet of any rabbi to learn. And he never, so he didn't go through their own rigorous training, but he went to his, his own rigorous training by the Holy Ghost. So they were, they were a bit confused. And the same thing happened with the apostles too. See, they are unlearned men. You, you didn't go through the, you know, you have to learn, go through a rigorous process to become a rabbi. You know, you must know who is your rabbi. Like Paul was studying of Gamaliel. Do you understand what I'm saying? Then they go to all that. And yet they, they are not revealing the mysteries of God. How? The scripture, the scripture, the scripture is woven by the spirit of prophecy. And the essence of, the, of, of, the, of, of what is in the scripture is the testimony of Jesus. So God wants you to be able to read in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and see Jesus. Everything from Genesis to Revelation is speaking to Jesus Christ. When God said, let there be light, he was talking about Jesus. But there was light, don't get me wrong, but he was still speaking of Jesus. So every revelation, every truth, everything that we want to know in God, if it is the truth, then it must be well established in Scripture. Amen. It must be well established in Scripture. We must be able to see it in the Scripture. I say, yes, this is indeed the truth. Amen.
So let me just say this flat out because there are other revelations out there now. Everybody wants to bring a revelation. If we cannot find your revelation, now, and, and, and the reason I said the, the, this thing I said, just what I just said now, is because people can just take scriptures one to and jump to ah, Moses took a, a rod, it became a serpent, and the, the guy now comes with a new revelation that there's the operation where you can just do serpent, serpent, serpent power action. Wait, 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 wait. That's why I said you must understand that there's a spirit of scripture. There is a spirit of prophecy that produced that document. And the emphasis of the spirit of prophecy is the revelation of the testimony of Jesus. That's why now that Moses has the brazen serpent that's been lifted up is called Jesus. You don't now go and erect the brazen serpent and put it in your house and say that because Moses lifted up the brazen serpent and it's in the scriptures. Do you get it? You put a brazen serpent. No, Jesus said that brazen serpent is me now. You don't have to know. If you try to do that, you will, you will produce idolatry. Mm -hmm. A demonic spirit will attach himself to that brazen serpent. Even though what you are doing is scripture, it is not according to the spirit of prophecy. Amen. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Alright, so uh, I want to establish that, that the matter of the Trinity is clearly established in scripture. Clearly. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we find this mystery of the Trinity clearly established in Scripture. Of course, in the Old Testament, it, it, it's introductory. In the Old Testament, the, 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 the mystery of the Trinity is there, but it is, it is a preparatory revelation and it's introductory. So it's not as, it's not as explicit, except you were able to look intently in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. But it's there. God will help us to go through that today. Amen. So let me move to, so the scriptures, according to my, just in, in finding my own little research, I discovered the scriptures, in my own opinion, the scriptures is not my own opinion, it's there, you see it. The scriptures is divided into three parts. The scripture, and I, 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 I do it, I, I do my division according to, you know, the, the court, the holy place, and the most holy place. So in the scriptures, you have the scriptures of the prophets, that is the Old Testament. The Bible calls the Old Testament. Anytime you see in the New Testament, they say, according to the scriptures of the prophets, he's speaking about the Old Testament. So we have the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi. Actually, from Genesis to John the Baptist. Then we have the New Testament. Now, in the New Testament, there are two parts. In the New Testament, we have the New Testament himself, which is the Gospels, Jesus Christ himself. And that's something God is going to do in this generation. God is going to bring back the place. That the gospels occupy. Because there's no greater revelation of God than the revelation of God by God. There is no higher teacher than the word himself. There is no greater truth than the truths spoken and taught by the word of God himself. Amen. So, in the New Testament, we have two parts. Okay, I think I'm, I've left. We have the Okay, well, let me just... Alright, so I've already said this. Okay, so in the two parts, we have the revelation of God by God with us, Emmanuel himself, the Gospels. Genesis, sorry, Matthew to John, then of course, the revelation of Jesus, where he taught, where he spoke, where he, you know, those things he said. And then, we have the rest of the New Testament, which is from Acts to the book of Revelation, the rest of that part. Now, for the believer... The Gospels, the teachings of Jesus, are the most holy place in the Scripture. The teachings of the Apostles are the holy place in the Scripture. Then the Scripture of the Prophets are the court in the Scripture. In terms of gravity and weight of, of, of standard, every teaching that you have, every revelation you have, you must be able to find it in the teachings of Jesus. You must be able to confirm it in the teachings of the apostles. And then, those are two witnesses, but the third witness is that you must find it also in the Old Testament. You know how to remember two or three witnesses in the Old Testament. So, in, in revealing the Trinity in the scriptures, let's go to the witness of the word himself. 
And then in John chapter 1, verse 1, hope you, you can open our Bibles in John chapter 1, verse 1. Okay, it's back here. Okay, that's John chapter 1, verse 1, we are told in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of man, and, and we know that. And verse 12, it says, sorry, verse 14. It says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So, and then we discover that that one who became flesh and dwelt among us, his name was called Jesus when he was born. So he shall call his name Jesus. Why? Because he shall save his people their sins. So the name was not just a name. The name was indicative of the, 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 the context in which God was revealing himself to man. God was revealing himself to man as salvation. So he says, call his name Jesus. So I say the name of Jesus. They are not just saying J-E-S-U-S. Jesus is not J-E-S-U-S. Jesus is Jehovah's salvation. So when you invoke Jesus, you are invoking salvation. Amen. So, so we have the word himself. Now the word became flesh. And this word came and for three and a half years he was teaching and all, opening the mysteries of God to us. He was showing us the mysteries of God. He was teaching us. And this word of God himself made it clear what he had come to do. As Moses, John chapter 3 verse 15, as Moses lifted up the brazen serpent, so also must the son of man be lifted up Why? So that whosoever delivers in him will not perish but have eternal life. Right? He said, For God so knows the world, and gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes will not perish but have eternal life. Later in John chapter 10, verse 10, he said, The thief comes but not but, but to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have my born. Then in John chapter 17, can you open that? John 17. John 17. From verse 1 to 3. He said, Now Jesus lifted up his eyes unto heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also be glorified. As you have given power. As according as you have given him power, authority over flesh, to give eternal life to as many as you have given him. That's verse 2. Verse 3, he says it categorically. This is life eternal. This is, so this is what you received. This is life eternal. That they may know thee, the only true God. Oh, brother. This scripture changed my life. Discovering John 17, verse 3. If without that scripture, I can't be here to be. It's not possible. This scripture. That they may know thee, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So eternal life is to know God. It's not to live forever. Eternal life in the scriptures is defined from two contexts. Eternal life is defined from the context of God. And in the context of God, eternal life is the true God. Eternal life is also defined from the context of our, our experiencing God. And in that context, eternal life is defined as the knowledge of God. So for us, eternal life is the knowledge of God. For God, eternal life is what he is. It's his life. So, to know the true God is what eternal life is. So Jesus made it clear that he came to give us eternal life and he defined that life. So that there won't be confusion. Eternal life himself defined eternal life. I said eternal life is to know the true God and Jesus Christ only he has sent. Now, this Jesus who is the word of God, who is God himself, told us explicitly, revealed the Godhead explicitly, to be Trinity. Matthew 28 verse 19. Let's open it. Jesus himself. So, this is not a matter of um, theologians are trying to argue whether, no. Now, even though the word Trinity is not used in the Bible, that word Trinity, it's, it's a way of um, conceptualizing and describing a mystery that is very deep. You know, the tr Trinity or the Triunity, the Triune God. So, if they are one, Unity, but they are three. Tri so, Triune, Trinity. One God for three persons. Matthew 28, verse 19. Oh, I imagine I'm thinking that. <laughs> Matthew 28, verse 19. It says, Can we read it together? I want to go. Going here and the Yes. Now, do you know what, what is this? Okay, ah, let me not go there. Okay, so let me see where I'm staying. Where I'm going. Jesus himself clearly revealed the God here. Now, notice the way it said. Notice that language. Going into all the world, what's written in the Greek is disciple the nations, all the nations. That's what's written in the Greek, disciple all the nations. Baptizing them into the name. Notice, it is name. In the literal Greek, it is name, singular. It's not names. This is the word of God. There's no clearer revelation than the revelation of God by God. That's why now that God has spoken to us in the Son, there's no more God speaking of God. This is the, because it's the perfect and complete revelation of God. There will be no more speaking of God after. There's not like after Jesus. It's the end, beginning and the ending. 
So this is the pristine, this is the zenith of the very revelation. The revelation of God by the word himself. And it's made it clear to us that the Godhead is a name in three persons. Name, singular. Baptizing them into the name, not the names. The name, singular. The name of the Father. That name is also the name of the Son. And that name is also the name of the Holy Ghost. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, clearly three persons. Because the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, those are three clear descriptions of three distinct personalities. But it says these three people have one name. So the Father has that name. The Son has that name. The Holy Ghost has that name. What is that name? God. So the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Ghost is God. From the mouth of the Word of God, you say. For me, once I saw the scripture, that's the end. There's no debate anymore. This is the end. The Son of God himself, the Word of life, the one who came to give us the knowledge of God said that the Godhead is a name in three persons. One God in three persons. So what the Father is, is God. What the Son is, is God. What the Holy Ghost is, is God. That's clear, the name. But then you see, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Now, when he says, you need to understand. That's why I said, he's not saying baptizing into the names of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. No, 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 no. Not that the Father has a separate name, and the Holy Ghost has a separate They have distinct personalities, yes. But they don't have a separate name. A name is the identity of an entity. That's what a name is. So your name is what you are. You. You are your name. Do you understand that? So, because in the realm of the spirit, names are not, it's not English. So that's why I said, when God they said, call him Jesus. It was not just give him J E S U S. No, he said, because he will save his people from their sins. So this name is a reality that Jehovah's salvation has appeared. Do you get it? Do you get what I'm saying? So, he says, baptize them into the name of three people. So, three people are sharing one name. Three people are one name. But now, there are also three. So, I say this way. What the Godhead is, is God. Now, the true God, in 1 John 5, verse 20, the true God is called eternal life. This is the true God. King James says, ah, actually it should be even eternal life. So eternal life is what the true God is. So if you fall into the category of being is called the true God, then the way we will know is that you have a life that is eternal. Everything God created is a life. Everything that everything is God created is a kind of life. But God defines his own kind of life. By one ultimate character. And that character is called eternality. I'll, I'll, I'll get there in, in, in the teaching. And so that's why the, the, the God life is defined as eternal life. So that's what the true God is. Now, the Father is this, the Son is this, the Holy Ghost is this. But now, that's what they are. But then there, there's who God is. Who, who they are is their essence. What they are is their essence. So, they are God in essence, but in person, they are very distinct. Not distinct, not, when I say distinct, they are not separate. They are not separate. It's not as if they have, this one is doing this one thing, this one is doing this one thing. No, they are one. But they are distinct. They have distinct personalities. We therefore confer on them distinct personal functions. For instance, the Son of God, because He is the Son, is the Word of God and the image of God. So if the Godhead, when the Godhead wants to comprehend themselves, Jesus, the Son of God, is the resource for that. The Father knows His being in the Son. The Holy Ghost knows His being in the Son. Because He is the, by virtue of being the Son, is the Word of God. So when God wants to show you what He looks like, God doesn't come to you. God, God tells Jesus to show if Jesus shows up before you, when you see Jesus, you will see God. When God comes, you, 
He's there. He can shake your hand. The Father God can shake your hand. But you don't know who is in him. He's in him. The Godhead is a mystery that you can't talk. Meanwhile, that same Godhead, that same eternal life, when he shows up in the person of the Son, I can say, ah, oh, so this is who you are. Why? Because of their presence. What of the Holy Ghost? Oh, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the person that makes their communication possible. There's no fellowship. So the Father and the Son cannot have fellowship apart from the Holy Ghost. It's not possible. Just say you can't have fellowship with God. Apart from, you know when Jesus appeared in the Revelation, after just finished talking, he said, Everything that I hear what the Spirit is saying, you know what he's saying? Everything I'm saying, the only way you can really hear and receive it is when you will receive it in the Spirit. Apart from the Spirit, you can't hear what I'm saying. Because he is the person, the God that gives participation. So, their persons are distinct. Their persons are distinct, but their essence is one. Did you get that? Their persons are distinct, but their essence is one. They are God in essence, but they are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in person. So, and I usually say, the Son of God is not junior God. No, junior God. No, when you say the Son of God, it's the spiritual language, it's not physical language. The Son of God is God in the personality of His Son. He's not inferior God. No. Ah, we're getting some things, government. We're getting some things. So that because there's a place of submission and all those things in the context of their work. Amen. Praise God. All right. So, Jesus has clearly, I said, note there that the word name is singular. And that's the key. That's the key that unravels that scripture. The name. So, it's one name. The three of them are one name. Amen. Let's go. Now, if you read the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 3, you discover something very important. I, I, I want to be as fast as possible. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 says something very important. It says that, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and then was confirmed to us by them that heard him? So the purpose of the ministry of the apostles was to confirm what Jesus at the first began to speak. So Jesus is the first speaker of the New Testament message. He's the first and chief speaker. The word first there is first both in terms of time and in terms of preeminence. Jesus is the first speaker of the gospel. He's the chief speaker of the gospel. And then every other ministry that comes after Jesus is confirmatory in nature. He simply comes to say again what he has already said. In new words, new language, in new dimensions, new manifestation of the spirit and all that, but you are just saying again what he has said. That's why Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in non-religious for weakness. If he says this, that is very, very, it's defining something very definite. This, which gospel? The question is, yourself is which gospel of the kingdom was available at that time? That was the gospel Jesus himself was preaching. So Jesus is saying that the message I preach now, at the end, it will be what we preach in non-religious for weakness. The message that this gospel. So it's not going to change. The gospel is called the everlasting gospel. So every ministry after Jesus is designed to confirm or say again what he has already said. So the, the witness of the apostles, and that's why I use the word, the confirmatory witness. The apostles confirm the ultimate witness, which is the witness of the word himself. The apostles make it clear that God is the truth. If we go to John chapter, 1 John chapter 5 verse 7, very clear, John makes it clear. The reality of the Trinity. It says there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And these three are one. Can we see that? First John 5, 7. Quickly. First John 5, 7. Very quickly. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And these three are one. Are we there? Can we read it out very quickly? Yes? We can read together. Yes. Yes. I won't. Thank you very much. So we see that very clearly that the Father, there are three that bear record in heaven. They bear witness to the reality that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the context of that scripture. And the three of them are one. The Father, the Word, and the Spirit. Amen. If you 
you read John chapter 1, we read that before. John chapter 1, verse 1, it shows us two persons there who are God. In fact, the way it's written in the Greek is, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with the God. And God was the word. That's how it's written in the Greek. And that's very important because what he's saying is, now he says, and the word was with the God. Anytime you have, anytime the scriptures are writing about the person of the Father in the New Testament, the article the is added to, to God. The God. But you know, we don't pronounce that. <coughs> we don't pronounce that in English. We just say God. We don't have to put the article. But well, that's how it's written. But then when it now says, and God was the word, it is a he, God was the word. It's not talking about the person of the Father. So there's another entity who is God, who is the word. So there's a Godhead person who is the word. A person of Godhead is the word, and he is with the God. That's the Father. So we have two there, but first John chapter 5, verse 7 shows us three. Now, the witness of Apostle Paul, let's read. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 to 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 to 6. I put these other scriptures. The Romans chapter 9, verse 5 shows us that Christ is God. Romans chapter Titus chapter 3, verse 13 shows us that Christ is God. But 1 Corinthians chapter 4, chapter 12, verse 4 to 6. If you are there, please read for me. They are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Differences of administration, but the same Lord. The same Lord. And there are diversities of operations. There are diversities of operations, but the same work, the same God. The but the same God, God who works. Do you see that? You see the bit of it? I like it. The spirit responsible for the empowerments, the gifts. The Lord responsible for the administrations. And God responsible for the operations. Three of them are there. And it's important because. Whatever is the operation of God can only be administered by a Godhead person because you have to be on God's class to prosecute God's intention. To be able to accomplish God's eternal purpose or contribute to lend your divine impute to God's eternal purpose, you have to be in his class. You have to be in that council to see that okay, this is the operation, so yeah, this is how it is to be administered, and then this is the empowerment by which this will be administered. So these three persons, the spirit, even though the emphasis here is in the Trinity revealed in their work, but you still see the fact that they are three. Is this clear to us? I, I, I'm taking a, 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 an interesting route. I, I, I pray that it's beneficial to us. I'm supposed to the first break. Okay. So let me just wrap. Okay, let me wrap up this the reality of the Trinity and then we'll take the first break. Alright, so, so we've seen that, and I've also said the other scriptures. Now, uh, in the witness of Apostle Peter, okay, let's, now, Apostle Peter kind of, it's kind of combined. In Acts chapter 5, verse 3 to 4, Peter tells us that the Holy Ghost is God. Acts chapter 5, verse 3 to 4, Peter tells us that the Holy Ghost is God. Somebody should open that one. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, Peter tells us that the Father is God. Somebody should open that one also. Then in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 to 12, Peter tells us that the Lord Jesus is God. So, who is in Acts chapter 5, verse 3 to 4? Very quickly, go ahead, please read for me. Thank you. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? And to give back part of the gift of the land. Yeah. Yes. 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 Beautiful. He received from God who? 
the Father. So Peter makes it clear that God the Father. The Father is God. Because out of two or three witnesses, what is this? These are three witnesses. Three. Three of the foremost apostles in scriptures. They show you clearly that this person is God. And then finally, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 to 12, 2 Peter 3, 10 to 12, who opened that one for me, please? Go ahead. <laughs> Notice what he said, the day of the Lord, that's the, whenever you see the Lord in the New Testament, majority of the time, the Lord is speaking of Jesus Christ. Go ahead. Right, he will come as a thief in the night. We know that it is the Lord that is coming back, the Lord Jesus. So we know that it is Jesus talking about. Yes? 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 Yes?
variety of persons. I, I hope you are following the lecture thus far. So this is from the Old Testament. Because that's what I said, the Old Testament is introductory, but it's preparatory, it's not in the New Testament, it's explicit. Now, Moses now gives us another interesting angle to this in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Very quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. This is another scripture that's quite popular, uh, quite, quite um, famous. See, hear, O Israel. Yes, who is there? Yeah. Please read for me. Yes, sir. Yeah, O Israel. Yes. The Lord our God is one. I like your voice. This is your reading voice. Very good. The Lord our God is one Lord. So, if you notice the word Lord there, if you're using King James, it's a capital letter. The word Lord. Whenever you see Lord, are you listening to me? Whenever you see the word L O R D or G O D, you hear me? Whenever you, you see the word L O R D or G O D in King James in the Old Testament in capital letters, the word there in the literal Hebrew is Yahweh. It's not Lord or Elohim. It's not Adonai or Elohim. It's Yahweh. That is the personal name of God that you reveal to Moses. Jehovah. Someone else called it Jehovah or Yahweh. Because we don't quite know how it's pronounced because the name was so secret, they choose to pronounce it. Anywhere they saw it written, they will replace it with Adonai. That's how much they respected and reverenced the name. But that reverence will translate to not taking the name of the Lord in vain. The name of the Lord should produce his fruit in your life. Don't take it in vain. If you are called by his name, then produce reality that shows that you are called by his name. Don't take his name in vain. So I said, that's not taking the Lord in vain. It's not like, don't say it without what to say. But of course, the reverence can, it's okay. It's no problem. As long as it produces the fruit in our life. So the respect that name is supposed to be added. So the way the King James Version helps you to differentiate between when it's Yahweh and when it's Adonai is that you replace you will write Lord in capital letter. Or when it's Yahweh, to differentiate between Yahweh and Elohim, you write God in capital letter. So anytime you see capital letter, it's Yahweh that is there. So he's saying, Yahweh, our God, is one Yahweh. Meaning there is no, there are no other gods. There's only one God. And that God is Jehovah. There's no other entity in this universe that is God. Because people who are living in the context of an age of idolatry all around, all the nations are their gods. So that's when our own God is not known. There's only one God. And that God is Jehovah. And it has been God that, we have, that has been known by man from Genesis chapter 1. Chapter 2. And the Lord God formed the man from just the ground. Jehovah God. So Jehovah or Yahweh is the being that is God and is one. Yet, in Genesis chapter 1, we've discovered that this being, that is God, is plural. So you can see that the mystery of the Trinity is already being alluded to here. It doesn't tell you explicitly that there are three people, but you can already see there's one God, yet this God is a variety of persons. Do you get it? So it's there in the Old Testament, you know, as God helps us. Now, the witness of the prophets, I don't know if that's the one, Isaiah chapter 48, verse 15 to 16. Isaiah chapter 48, from verse 15 to 16. Isaiah, now, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, we know that one. Don't go there. Hold that Isaiah 15, 15, 16. You're going for me. Now, Isaiah 9, 6, unto us, the other one, unto us, given, and always shall be a punch, and his name shall be a wonderful counsel, the mighty God, everlasting Father. So, that tells you clearly that the Son is God. Mighty God, everlasting Father. That's the Son. Who okay. came? So, we know that the Son is God. All right? Now, let's do Isaiah. Uh, read it for me. Isaiah 48, verse 15 and 16. I. I. Even I have spoken. Have spoken. Yea. Yea. I have called him. I have called him. I have brought him. I have brought him. And he shall make his way prosperous. And he shall make his way prosperous. Come in here unto me. Come in here unto me. Hear ye this. Hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was. From the time that it was. There am I. There am I. That's I am. Yes. And now the Lord God. Now the Lord God. And his spirit. And his spirit. Has sent me. Oh, that's the Trinity there. Did you see that? The person speaking himself is God. Ah, even I. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, that which is from the beginning. There am I. And now, the Lord God. Ah, I thought you are God. Yes, but there's another one. The Lord God and His Spirit. That is, so the Father and the Spirit. Now look at the interesting thing. Because I want to reset this in Hebrew. He said, Has sent me. That is not grammatically correct, but it's spiritually correct. Mm -hmm. English will say, the Lord God and His Spirit have sent me. Mm -hmm. We did English now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
That's what should be correct. When you use and, it should be have, plural. If you use with, then it can be singular. But he said, the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. That should be accurate. He said, no, has sent me. You know why? Because the Father and the spirit are one. But there are distinct persons. The Lord God and his spirit has sent me. I am. Who is from the beginning? Oh, do you get it? So the Trinity is in the Old Testament. Ah, are you understanding this? It's beautiful. You know, it's explicit in the New Testament, so it's a bit easy to find it. But in the Old Testament, God helps you to it. It's like you're hunting for treasure. Ah, so this thing is here, sir. It's there. You, you will find it. It's there. It's there. As God helps us. Then other witnesses, this one shows us two persons. Proverbs chapter 13, interestingly, interestingly. Proverbs. In Proverbs, we have this reality there. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4, very quickly. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. Oh, okay, I need to make it. Yeah. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4, quickly. If you are there, please read for me with a very loud voice. Who has ascended up into heaven? Who has ascended up into heaven? Yes. Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound the waters in the garment? We know that it's God that did all these things. That God created the heavens and the right? Yes? What is his name? What is his name? And what is his son's name? And what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. If thou canst tell. So even in Proverbs, we are told what is his name and what is his son's name. So you can see from there that, at least we have two there. The father and the son. That's what the Bible calls the scriptures, the Old Testament, the scriptures of the prophets. So, even Proverbs is scripture of the prophets. Job and all, all the rest of them. Because he took the inspiration of the Spirit to, to produce that document. Amen. Amen. Alright, so, the Old Testament is a bit, you know, what we're able to see. So, from this Old Testament, we can see. So, we saw in Isaiah explicitly, we saw the three of them. In Genesis, in Moses, we saw that, we saw that God is plural and God is one. But in Isaiah, we saw the three explicitly stated. And here, Proverbs, we saw two. Now, I just want to say this. Later on, I'll go into this. Now, let me skip this slide because I have it in the, I have it in the future. I'll, I'll refer to it if I come back. So, in completely reality of the Trinity, okay, what I just want to say here is, what I just want to say in this previous slide is that there are certain things in the scriptures that are exclusive to deity. Only a being that is God can do those things. Only a being that is God has those characteristics and only a being that is God can do those things. And those things are ascribed to three persons. Only deity can create original creation. And only deity can save. And those two feats are ascribed to three persons in the scriptures. Those are deity defining realities. There are some things that God and man can do. God can talk, man can talk. But man, creation cannot produce original creation. Man is created because he is created by God to be creative. Original creation is only possible to date. Salvation is also only possible to date because it is the thing that created that can remedy that thing when the thing is destroyed. So these are deity defining realities. Oh, Jesus. I just want to just establish again. It's just bubbling my spirit that God can save. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but them. I don't know what it is, but God can save. God can save. It is something that He brags about as being exclusive to Him. Only God can save. He can save. Oh, it's coming to me to encourage somebody. I don't know the situation, the circumstances, whatever it is, but I want to let you know that God can save. That is something that He does as. To prove his CV that he's God. As surely as he can create, he can save. Of course, it is a higher work to save than to create. In salvation, God is revealed in a higher way than in creation. But those two things belong only to deity. Oh, God can save. You know, we're not just doing a lecture, we are ministering the devotion of spirit and power. So that we are doing a lecture doesn't mean that God cannot minister to us. You understand what I'm saying? So in conclusion, both the Old Testament and the New Testament reveal God, the true God, to be tribal. This is not the priority of gods that you find in among the pagan religions. In India, I think there are about how many gods? Maybe one million gods or something. Chris, 
Egyptian gods. Many gods. In different parts of the world, there have been plenty. But that's not, it's not, those are demonic spirits who are funny, who are masquerading as God. The Bible says the idols of the nations, they are not God, but they are devils. Since the things which they sacrifice to idols, they do not sacrifice to God, but to devils. And it's interesting that in every culture of the earth, as we know, ancient culture, there has been idolatry. Idolatry is one constant thing. Anywhere in the world that you go to, if you check the history of that culture, if you check it to, you'll find that at some point they used to worship idols. Because man knows at his core that he's not God. I don't want to say I'm God. Man knows. Man knows that he's created to worship something. So in every culture, without any correspondence, without doing Zoom conferences, they know that there's something that they should worship. They just know. Because no one was created to worship God. But the devil has found a way to deceive men and praise them and all that kind of stuff. Amen? Mm-hmm. So this revelation is introduced and preparatory in the Old Testament, but it's clearly and explicitly revealed in the New. In the Old Testament, it is introduced, it is preparatory, but in the New Testament, it is clear established that the triune the true God is triune and there's three persons who are one triunity triunity that's how we got the word that's how we get the word trinity okay three try you one so three who are one amen okay so I'm going to conclude with the of trinity now let's unveil the trinity let's let's reveal them now the perspective that the Holy Ghost has given to me to present this to us is, 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 is a bit interesting because in the unveiling of the Trinity, if you study scriptures, in the unveiling of the Trinity, you discover that there are two aspects to the revelation of the Trinity, two major aspects to the revelation of the Trinity. And those two aspects I have called the exclusive Trinity and the inclusive Trinity. From the words exclusive, exclude and include. Exclusive means separated by yourself. Other, different, separate. Inclusive means in union with you, together with you. Do you understand that? Now, the exclusive trinity speaks about the trinity in the reality of their essential existence and being. In that dimension, we are just speaking about the trinity in their own being as themselves. Apart from any activity, apart from anything created, apart from... So this is just God as he exists in himself in eternity of eternities. Before God thought about doing anything, where God is. That is, we are dealing with the reality of God in that name called I am. Just his being. Just God in that existence of himself in himself, in fellowship with himself. There, there is no purpose there's no eternal purpose, there's no eternal work, there's no, no, there's no all that. There's just the being of God. Because there has to be God existing first before God now decides to do something. So this exclusive trinity is exclusively about the being, the essential existence and essence of the triangle. So in that realm, we are dealing with God as he is alone. In himself, apart from all things. The inclusive trinity, however, deals with God as he is revealed in the context of his work. In the context of his eternal purpose. So there, in the inclusive trinity, we have God in relation to things that are not God. That are not essentially God. I have known that before God created anything, the only thing there was was God. And God did not create from nothing. Because there was nothing like nothing. There was always God. God created from himself. Out of himself, he brought all things. But before he did anything, it's just God by himself, ex- exclusively. Just God. And God was enjoying himself by himself. God created out of an overflow of his goodness. God was enjoying himself too much. He said, let me share this thing. That's what made God extend this thing to us. We were not part of the equation initially. That's why he says, I am. He says, tell them, I am. I said, I, I am. I am has no respect. There's no context in which you can put time in the statement called I am. I am is I am. He's an ever present now. God is. I am. So in his being, that's what he is. Apart from any work. Now, in his work, you know what the work is really about? In his work, he decides to unveil his being. To things that 
and not himself. The application of that thing is he has to make them because there's nothing, there's nothing like nothing, it's just God. So we see the Trinity in the exclusive reality. We see the Trinity in the inclusive reality. It's inclusive because we are now included. Creation is not things that are not God. Things apart from God are now included in that revelation. So the context of the context of the Trinity being revealed to things that are not themselves, that context is called the inclusive Trinity. And that context is actually defined by their eternal purpose. Their eternal, their work, eternal work. But their eternal being is exclusive. Do we get this? And that's why no matter how much more we, how much we have been refined together with Christ, we, we are seated together in Christ Jesus on the right hand of God. Uh, you are aware of that. We are seated in Christ, right? Yet, there will, it will never happen in eternity forever that you, the body of Christ, will worship. Because you are not God. You are a partaker of the divine nature, but you are not a partaker of deity. Nobody will ever worship you because you are not God. But Jesus is our brother, yet he is God. Because he is from that class. He came to extend the divine life to where he is from that. Jesus is deity. He is not just the savior of the world. He is deity. He is not just the man Christ Jesus, the middle of the world. No, he is deity. So he, he belongs to that class. In the exclusive class as deity, he is there. But he's also came to us. He also came to us to become our brother. He's not ashamed to call us brethren. Do we understand this? So these are, if you read the scriptures clearly, uh, that if you want, if you if you use these lenses to approach the Trinity, the Trinity will be a very practical revelation to you. It will just be a theological thing in your mind. Because I know that these three beings are involved in my life as a believer. Every reality of salvation must have the stamp of the three persons of the Trinity. In your ministry, the Trinity is involved. There's what the Father, the Father determines the operation. The Son determines the administration. The Holy Ghost determines the empowerment or enablement to get that thing done. So the Father determines what will be done. The Son determines how you will do it. Then the Holy Ghost gives you the enablement to get it done. Then you in the enablement of the Spirit get it done. That's how it works. So the Trinity is with you in that assignment. They are, they are very, they, 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 they are not oneness. So the Father will never do the work of the Holy Ghost or the Son. They, they, they are very, and the, and the reason for that is their persons. What actually happened is, what, actually, what, what is actually happening is that in their work, they reveal their persons. But in their work, they are arranged in a unique way. That they, they are not exactly in their being. Because in their being, there's no work. It's just about being God. They are not trying to save anybody. They are not trying to create anything. It's just about being themselves. So there's nothing like this one submitting himself to the Father to come and do salvation. No, there's nothing like that. It's just, they're just God. But when they want to do work, they arrange themselves. Because God is love, so God is humility. So it doesn't cost God anything to come low and say. So you must be able to dis distinguish between the Trinity as in dealing with their being and the Trinity in dealing with their understand what I'm saying. So too many aspects. Now, another thing that is important to note is that both realities are eternal. In the first, which is the exclusive trinity, you are dealing with their eternal essence. So that is their essential eternity. That is eternality or eternity that has no beginning of this end of life. It's about their being. In the second reality, that is the, exclu the inclusive trinity. Okay, I said here, I said the first. Is essential eternity, and that deals with their being, which is inherent and immediate. So God is, He always is, and immediately. There's no time where God was not. God is. God didn't create Himself. God is. He was not created. He is, and He is yesterday, today, and He is. But you see, the work of God is derived from His being. The work of God is subsequent and consequent to his being. That is, it is because he is that he decides to do. It is because he is that he decides to work. And in that work, what he has decided to do is to reveal what he is in his exclusive nature that you cannot press him. That the exclusive, that the exclusive trinity is the dimension of God you will never access. It's impossible to break into that realm. But they have decided to make what they are in that exclusive reality become available to us. So in the exclusive trinity, it's about them. It's about their being. It's about them enjoying their fellowship and, and, and just enjoying the 
themselves, being God. But in the inclusive trinity, it's the trinity revealed in them, it's, it's the trinity revealed in their work. So they, these exclusive beings, decide to reveal themselves to things that are not them. And it's in that context alone that we know them. But the beautiful thing is that what they reveal in the inclusive trinity is actually what they are in the exclusive trinity. So you are not, there's no loss, you are actually knowing them. But it's just that they have to make that arrangement available for you to be able to know them. Because the Godhead is an invisible being. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are invisible. Invisible doesn't mean you cannot see them with your physical eyes. Invisible means you cannot know them. They are beyond what you can comprehend. Yet, they make themselves comprehendable. They make themselves available. What they have done is simply to design a system where you will be forever knowing them. So you will be on a journey that will never end. That's the best they will do. Because you can't comprehend, go around God and set out God. You can't. God is, God is, God is too much. Too much is not even, you know, it's not even enough to describe this being. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, they are, oh Jesus, they are eternal mysteries. So, but what they have done is that they have made it in such a way that they have created an arrangement where we can be on a journey of exploration forever. That's what we have in Christ Jesus. Do you understand that? So it is in their work that they are revealed to things that are not themselves. And that's the work to reveal themselves. So their work of what I call their eternal purpose, according to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 or 15. Is it 3? 3, 16. Their eternal purpose is eternal. But that is eternity that is derived from their being. Meaning, at some I don't want to say at some point, because it's not even a point. So, can, you, can, can, can we do something right now? Can you picture the Godhead existing? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost enjoying their fellowship, enjoying their bond of oneness, just flowing into one another, and just, just blessing one, just loving one another. Then I always say, come guys, wait now. This thing that we're enjoying, let's not enjoy it alone now. Let's, let's hear it. Let, let's, let's make ourselves become a very part. So, what do you think is that? There's nothing. There's only us, so we have to create the things that we will enjoy us. That's how, that shows you that God was not under any compulsion. Because he even had to make the people that were knowing. You get it? So that, 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 that reality, where that decision is made, is also eternal. But it's a derived eternity from their being. So the eternal purpose is also eternal. It's also in a realm called eternity. But it's, a, it's an eternity that flows out of the, the, the eternal essence. So in scriptures, you discover that there, there, are two, there are two dimensions of eternity, or there are two ways eternity is revealed in scriptures. There is the exclusive eternity, and then there is the eternity of the eternal purpose of God. The eternal purpose of God, the eternity of the eternal purpose of God is also called in the scriptures the beginning. That's not the beginning of time. That is the, that is the origin of all things that have to do with God's counsel and everything that God has ever and will ever do. And that is also the end, where everything is coming from. That eternity of the eternal purpose is called the way that which was from the beginning. That is not the beginning of time. The beginning in John chapter 1, verse 1 is different from the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning in Genesis chapter 1 was the beginning of creation. The beginning in John, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 is the beginning of the. It is that eternal existence of the world or of God in the context of the eternal purpose. Because it is from there we begin to know. That's where the knowledge of God is available to us. The exclusive trinity is a mystery. We will never break into it. We will never come into that class. We will never get into God. We, we have been giving them in their work for us to be exploring them. You know, some of these things are a bit, I, I trust God for help because they are, they are quite, you know, I, I know I started by saying the mystery of the trinity is a mystery, but the Holy Ghost is with us and we, we are exploring. Amen? Mm -hmm. So there are two, so the second is derived eternity, dealing with their work, which is originated from secondary and consequent to, and because of their being. So the purpose of their work is to reveal their being. It's because they are loved, they decided to reveal themselves, to share themselves. Amen. So I have explained this, the exclusive trinity. This order deals with their eternal, essential existence as being God in and by themselves. Here we deal with their existence and, and being as deity, even I am. And that Deity is called the eternal life. Oh, I will get here. I will get there. What? In this, they are simply, 
only God. That's all they are. They are not Savior. They are not Creator. They are not Redeemer. They are just God. Here is about being themselves. So they are not they, they, they are not revealed in the context of any any oppression. It's just their essence. They are God. Who? Or who they are? So the first question: What they are? Who they are? In this, they are unique persons of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And Jesus actually revealed that to us. How are they in this reality? In this reality, they simply and essentially exist as one and they exist at once. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost exist as one and they exist at once. So the fa- there's no Father without the Son. There's no Son without the Father. There's no Father without the Son and the Spirit. There's no Spirit. There's no Spirit without the Son and the Spirit. The three of them exist as one and at once. It's impossible for one to exist without the many two. If there's no one, if one of them is missing, they're all are missing. Because they exist as one. And they exist at once. This is how they are. They're still just existing. When we get to heaven, we explore them. It's going to be amazing. God has called us to know him. This is the greatest privilege God can give to anything that is not himself. To know him. To explore him. Kai! God is a field of treasure that we explore with eternity. Just knowing him. The beauty of his glory. Aye. We will know God. Someone say, I will know God. I will know God. Because what we are called to do as ministers is to give the knowledge of God to men. To deliver God to men. That's what we are called to do. Not just in teaching. Teaching is a major part of it. But in demonstration. In living out their life. So you see a man living like God. How is that possible? Because he's called the mystery of adoption. We can, we can adopt you. We can please you and give you participation in our reality. You start behaving like us. You need to operate like us. You become our witness, our message to a, to a generation. It's possible. Because Jesus has made that possible. He has given it to us. That's why God was made place to show you that God can be revealed in human flesh. So this is just a chart to help you understand what we are talking about. So here you see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So if you look at the arrows, the bigger arrows, the Father is not the Holy Ghost. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Ghost. The Son is not the Father. The Holy Ghost is not the Son. The Holy Ghost is not the Father. But the Father is God. The Son is God. And the Holy Ghost is God. So what they are, that what they all are, that they all share, is that essence of being dead. They are all God. But in presence, they are distinct. So this is just a chart to help you. So just a picture. So with this picture, you can already start. You already have the idea. Okay, this, 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 this. Okay, they are God. Ah. Uh-huh. 
are not the same persons. No matter how much God loves you, God cannot come. The Father cannot die for you on the cross. It's not possible. Because it's not the world. Let me go there. Let me just have already seen those things. So, okay, let me just say that. Let me say that. It's not the world. If he does that, perhaps, peradventure by chance, it will lead to no practical benefit in terms of you coming to understand what happened. Because the Father is an uncrackable code. The Godhead, the Father, the Father is the Godhead in the uncrackable form. Then he cracks himself in the person of Jesus. So Jesus is the Father that is believed, that is not real, that is comprehensible. So Jesus has to do, if the Godhead has wants to do anything, that was what he doesn't propose was killing him. There's no other way they would have done it. Because the, the purpose of their eternal purpose is to redeem themselves. So since they want to redeem themselves, they have to set that purpose in the world. Otherwise, you won't know God. God will just go to the cross and nothing. You will not know. You won't be able to come into an experience and understanding of what will happen. You know? So these persons have distinct persons, distinct personalities, and those personalities now learn unique functions because of their persons to them. Do you get it? So their functionalities. In the Godhead are the result of their persons. But in essence, they are one. So you have the person of the Father, the person of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, their name, that is, what are they called in Scripture? Now, that name is actually called eternal life. And I explained earlier, I said, everything created is a life. Everything that exists is a kind of life. So, every life, so there are, there's angelic life, there's human life, there's Adam, I mean, there's Adamic life, there is, um, Biological life, there's the plant life, animal, they're all lives. They're even inanimate life. So you know everything is that everything is living. There's nothing that is dead in that sense. The stars are vibrating, atoms. This, this, this thing is moving, moving it's vibrating. Mr. Nigel. If when you enter into some dimensions of physics, you discover that this thing is moving. This thing can jump from one level to another. Yeah. This 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 thing that we're looking at like this. Because there are atoms inside and there are things are going on inside there. They are life. That's when Jesus said, Task a place, everything comes alive. If Jesus enters your room, your room, your room will be greeting. And because he made the, he knows the signature of everything, because he's the life of all things. Oh God, we we, we know Jesus. Yeah. Eternal life. So the Godhead is ultimately characterized by indefinition. When they want to define the kind of life among all lives that is the God class. That life is named and defined by this character and this quality called eternality. And that's why the Godhead is called the eternal life. And you see that manifested in that name, I am. The self-existent eternal one. So, who is the true God? Eternal life. The life that is eternal. That's why you read the same thing say, the life, the eternal. The life that is eternal. That is the God life. That is the God species. The life. Oh, there are many lives, oh, but when you see the life that is eternal, that is the eternal. Now, what is the. Because of that, the distinct reality of their life being eternal, they are therefore in the class of themselves. Which is the God class. That is the class of deity. God. So, in essence, that essence of eternal life, that essence, or that reality, what it is, is God or deity. That's what it is. In the exclusive realm, remember I said, in the exclusive being, they are not being anything. They are just being. And what they are in is everybody's God. They are just pure God. Pure, essentially God. Deity, just being themselves, fellowshipping with themselves, in union with themselves, enjoying their eternal company for eternity. They are always and will always be doing this. There's a sense in which this can never be broken. Can never be broken. Even though in their work they went through different phases, came to the head, died on the cross, but in their essence, it, 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 it's, it's one. They are one. So the essence of that name is that they are God. That's, that's the reality conferred upon them by the kind of life that they are. Do you understand what I'm saying? The kind of life that you are determines the kind of 
determines your estate. Determines what you are. Now, the, that eternal life confers upon them the estate called deity. That's why the true God is the eternal life. That is the life. That is God. Did you get that? That is the life. That is deity. There is a life that is a cherubim, a seraphim. There is a life that is human. When you have a certain life, when you look at you, based on that life, uh, this is a man. Why? If you check his DNA, his the code is humanity. That's the his human life, so is a man. Well, there's divine life. Divine life means true divine. Divine life means true God. That life is called the eternal life. Where you are, where that life in the way God has it makes you God. For instance, why are we children of God? Because this they found a way to carry this thing in and make it a seed and put it inside you. That's how you became a child of God. Now when they scan your DNA in the spirit, the very life of God is inside you. But in their exclusive reality, this life confers upon them the estate called deity. They are God. All by themselves to be worshipped forever and to be praised forever. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Can we just for two seconds, just, just worship God? Just worship God. This is not just an intellectual discourse. Just worship God. Just bless the Godhead. Bless the Father. Bless the Son. And bless the Holy Ghost. Just appreciate it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we have worshipped. Amen. We will continue that worship during the tea break. Just worship him now. So now, so they are persons, they are named, their essence. Now, because of their persons, they have what I call their a personal operation. That is, you know, every person, when you say this is his personality, you know, you say, ah, Joshua is, he has a cool personality. You say, oh, um, Sai has a, you know, <laughs> public personality. Do you know, there are different kinds of personalities based on the way you are as a person. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, that personality is what I'm defining here as their personal operation. So there's a way. That because God is the Father, there is a way He is. There is a way, there is a mannerism He has. There is a way He behaves. Because the Son is the Son, there is a way He is. There is a mannerism He has, there is a way He behaves. Because the Holy Ghost is the Holy Ghost, there is a way He is, there is a has, there is a way He behaves. Now, for the Father, that personal operation is actually also called the Father. What, that, what this means here is that this person of the Godhead is the person responsible for generating and offering the God life inside the Godhead. He's the generating plant in the Godhead. He's the father in the Godhead. Do you get it? He is the one who generates the life. So, for instance, so the father, so the son and the Holy Ghost, they come out of him, the father. Now, don't get, don't get it wrong. The son and the Holy Ghost are always inside the father. It's not as if there's any time that they were not there. They exist at once and at once. But the father is the his personality because he is the father. So what he does is that he is the generator. He is the father in the Godhead. He is the one who offers things. Who offers, because I didn't know the exclusive trinity, who offers the life. Not in a creative sense, but in the sense of source. Amen. For instance, let me give you, let me give you, let me give you an example. How many of you know the sun? The sun, S U N. Sun. Now, we understand that what is happening in the sun is nuclear reactions are going on between helium and some of these metals. Those nuclear reaction, reactions, fusion and fusion and what, what have you, are producing energy in form of light and heat. Now, but you see, the nuclear reactions. The heat and the light, all that process happens at the same time. Do you understand? They are happening together as the sun is burning, as the sun is, you know, is dead, blazing. The reactions are going on, the light is coming out, the heat is burning. They are all happening at the same time, but there are distinct operations going on. The nuclear reactions are the source of the light and the heat, but they exist at the same time as the light and the heat. It's not as if the light exists after. No, the, the reaction manipulates the light. So it's not like the evidence of the reaction is the light. I'm, I'm trying to explain. I don't know if you 
you get what I'm saying? So the light and the heat are manifesting in the instance of the reaction. It's not like the reaction first happens, then two years after the light will come up. Now, you may not see the light until, you know, because these stars are many light years away, some of these stars. But if the light was manifested the moment the reaction happened. You understand that? So, you can say that the nuclear reaction is the source of the light and the heat. It is the father of the light and the heat, but it's after the after The light is the part of that whole operation that gives you perception, that gives you ability to see. You can see the light. That is the that represents the Son of God. There is the Word of God, the image of God. You look at him and you see God. Then the heat represents the Holy Ghost. You can see him, but you can feel him. So if you don't have eyes, you won't know. You won't be able to know that inside the sun. There is a light. And if you don't have senses, thank you. If you don't have um, senses for heat, you won't know that there is heat being produced from the sun. The reason why you, when you look at the sun in a, in a bright day, you cannot look into it straight, you have to use the sunglasses, not because of heat, that's because of light. And remember when we did physics, there's one called wave particle duality mm -hmm. that energy can operate, can behave like particle, and can behave like wave. The same energy. God has factored his mystery to creation. He's there. I wonder how a scientist can look at these things and not see God. An enemy of God. Because if you really look at it, if you, you begin to, wow, God, you are reading, your signature is in everything you created. Another thing that gives you the concern of the Trinity is this mystery called mitosis. Do you remember in biology? Mitosis. How a cell, a cell can reproduce its exact copy. So one cell reproduces and it produces two cells that are exactly what the one cell is that created it, that reproduced it. Now in the case of mitosis, the first cell is gone. You can't find the first cell. But you have two cells that are exactly like what reproduced it. Right? That shows you that the capacity to be able to reproduce your very essence and be exactly what in mitosis, the cells are exactly the same. Right? Now in the case of the Godhead, the way it is that the cell that produced those two is still existing. So the three cells are existing together. To the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Alright. So I'm just trying to say, in, 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 in creation, in some of these things, God doesn't mean, think about the Son. Let's go. There's nuclear fusion going on, fusion going on. There is light and heat, and they are happening at the same time. So in a sense, you can say the nuclear reaction is the Father of the light. But it does not exist before the light. They happen at once. The father of the heat, whichever one of you, but they are existing operating together. Amen. Are you getting this? No, I don't, the mystery, I understand, but God is helping us to get this step by step. Amen. I have like one or two minutes more, so let's, let's finish this one. So the, the, the personality of the father confers upon him that operation I call the father. The father operation. The father operation is the operation of generation. He is the author of things in the God. Is the author of the deity existence in the Godhead. Not in the context of time, but in the context of existence. That there is a source of this whole thing. The Son, the oppression, the personal oppression of the Son is that the Son is the word and image. His function in the Godhead is comprehension. So in the God, in the God exclusive Trinity, the personality of the Son is this theater within which they comprehend themselves. The father comprehends his, his father. You can't can be father apart from the son. So he knows himself to the father in union with it, in conjunction with the son. Same thing with the spirit. So I already said before Jesus, before God gave us the mirror, he was his, he wants us to look in to be transformed. He was using the mirror himself. God looks in Jesus as his himself. So the world and image, the world speaks of comprehension in the context of audibility. The image speaks of comprehension in the context of visibility. You hear a word, you see an image. And you know in the scriptures, you are not a full witness until you have seen and heard. You have to see and hear. So there was so in God, in the song, there is a dimension of comprehension that is likened to audibility, to hearing of God. And then there is a dimension of comprehension that is likened to seeing him. So he is both the word and the image of God. Those two things in him make him the complete revelation of God. God understands himself in this person. So if God understands himself in Jesus, who are you? Did you get that? Now, that is something he is because he's the son. The Bible 
entonces, he says, a good tree brings forth good fruit. An evil tree brings forth evil fruit. How can you being able to speak good things? Tell you that your words are a reproduction of your life. Jesus is saying there that what a fruit is to a tree is what a word is to a meal. So the person speaking is reproducing the things inside his heart. You know the treasure in your heart is your life. How God doesn't know the treasure, but how do we produce your life? So the mystery of a word is that a word is a reproduction of the heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? A word is the reproduction of a being. So if Jesus is called the word of God, the only way he can be the word of God is because he is the reproduction. Reproduction of God's being. That means he's the word of God because he's the son of God. The reproduction, the fruit. It doesn't say a tree is known by its leaves. Even though leaves are, it says by its fruit. By that which is the product of its reproduction. So we, God can only be known by that which is the product of his reproduction. That is the son. So the reason why we can know God, why the son is the word and image of God, and God can be comprehended in him, is because Amen. Are we getting this? Of course, in scriptures, let me read something. There, there seems to be more emphasis on the person of the father and the son because the Spirit of God gives us the knowledge of them. Yes, and the, the Spirit of God came to speak of Jesus Christ reading the Father. That in the context of their work, there's a way they've arranged it. Amen. They are not, they don't want themselves, they are not seeking their own personal glory. They are, they are God. They don't have anything to prove to you. They are God. They are funny by themselves. They are okay. This is just an overflow of their book. The Spirit. So, now, the Holy Ghost, the first sin of the Holy Ghost, yes, his personal oppression in the deity is that he is the Spirit in the deity. So, there's God in the person of the Father. There's God in the oppression of the generator. There's God in the oppression of the comprehension, the entity that comprehension is possible. There's also God in the entity of the Spirit. Spirit is the person in the Godhead in whom the Godhead finds fellowship. Interaction, participation. It's, that's the work of the Spirit. So the Father and the Son cannot be in fellowship apart from the Spirit. And that advice us. Whichever triangle you want to draw, use that triangle. Whichever interaction you want to make, it cannot happen without the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is responsible for fellowship. So it's responsible for, so the Father communicates its essence to the Son through the Spirit and back like that. That communication is going on. Then the Spirit and the Son, then the Son and, and the, uh, the Spirit and the Father. And all that follow the arrangement. So he's responsible for communication. Movement, flow, fellowship. That's what he's responsible for. And that oppression is called spirit. 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 You know, you can be here and your spirit goes somewhere. You know, I think, do you know what I'm saying? The life has said, if not my spirit, my heart go with you. Just his spirit, that follow me as so Eliza was sitting down. If you saw Eliza, you see him sitting down. When that Eliza was sitting down, was writing on the journey with it's possible that that's part of how he was able to pick things in the bedroom of those guys. As they are discussing, he's there, but he's sitting in the room. Remember, there was time they came to Ezekiel. Elders came and sat before him to hear the word of God. And the spirit of God took him away. He was standing there, and the spirit of God took him away. The interesting thing is in the spirit. Spirit for movement, for flow. That's why I also like it to the wind. You know, the wind always moves. It's always moving. Communication. And remember that we are dealing with their essence. So this is them just interacting within themselves. So we'll stop there and um, we'll deal with the inclusive trinity. So that by the explanation of this, it's gonna be easy. Alright, so let's stop here. We are still unveiling the Trinity. Amen. Amen. We have dealt with their essence, their being. Now, these things that I've said here, I have a slide where there are scriptures that are showing you those things. I pasted them out. So that because I need it to be fast, because it's a lecture, so we have to be fast. PowerPoint is not supposed to be easy. It's points. You understand? So, as you take this, this slide and read the script, you read the scriptures, you begin to explore. Oh, this one. Oh, 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 oh. oh we begin to connect the dots. But I'll try my best to connect some things and quote some scriptures. I will have us read some scriptures that I'll be doing as necessary. Amen. Have we, have we been blessed thus far? Oh, really? Yes. Is this lecture boring? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I know we are dealing with the Trinity, but we don't really help us. Amen. Let's just thank God before we go on break. Let's just thank God and appreciate Him for what He has communicated to us thus far. Thank Him and just bless Him. Appreciate Him for what you have
what made them do the work of having to now create things. Both the first creation, the old creation, and then the new creation. Remember that all the work of God had been finished in eternity. This is the reality of eternity when they finish all their work. It's called the eternal purpose, which was proposed in Christ Jesus. It is in this dimension that they decided to make themselves known to a people who are not essentially deity, but whom they will give some, some level of participation or another, some level of fellowship with themselves, so that you can know them. Remember, the purpose of the inclusive trinity is the revelation of the exclusive trinity. The exclusive trinity is exclusive, but this, the exclusive trinity decides to make themselves known. And in making themselves known, they, they decide to do that in the context of a certain official arrangement. Here, they want to introduce themselves and communicate their reality to things that are not them. You must remember this. This is the purpose of their work. It's not because they were needy. It's not because they were lonely. It's because they wanted to share. God operates out of benevolence. He doesn't operate out of compulsion. That's why God also doesn't like when you give out of compulsion. That giving is not just giving money. When you give yourself to God in worship and surrender, even though it is his right, he wants you to do it within you. Not because God is forcing everybody. Worship me, I don't worship me, I'll kill all of you. No. It's not, it's not like that. It is in God's nature to be free. Liberty is God's nature. That's why he also made you free. That's why if you make a decision that after you have considered all the facts and figures, you don't want to be with God, you don't want to worship God, God will respect that your decision and confine you to a place called the lake of fire. It's a preparation for those who have made a free will decision to reject God. They don't want to be with God. So God creates a space to respect their free will. Because God cannot force you to worship Him. Even though He deserves it, this is right, but He won't force you, otherwise He's no longer free. Otherwise He's no longer giving. You know, worship is the highest form of giving. Worship is actually giving. We are giving the entirety of ourselves to Him. To be for Him at His displeasure. At, sorry, at His pleasure. At His disposal and for His pleasure. So, God is free. So, at some point, God decided, I'm sorry, that was not cut it. That grammar doesn't cut it because it's not really a time. It's not the time frame, but I don't know how to describe it. That's why the Bible just calls it the beginning. That is the moment, or that is the instance, that's the reality where God decides that this triune essence, this God that we are, we are going to make it available. And they designed an official arrangement to make that possible. So, the triune God manifested themselves in a certain way. It is in that capacity that we now have, we have fellowship with them. That way, that manifestation, that unveiling, is what I call the inclusive or official trinity. It's official because it's not a work here. It is still the persons, but the persons have rolled up their sleeves and they are doing a work on which is actually to reveal themselves. Do you get it? So, this is actually where we come to know them. But because it is what they are in their essence that we know, that they are revealing, when we know them in their official trinity, we are actually, we are actually discovering who they actually are in their essence. So actually, when you, when you meet them at this level, you are actually you are, you are discovering who they are in their being. So that's why I said in the inclusive trinity, the exclusive trinity is revealed. Alright, so the eternal purpose. Now what is the eternal purpose? The eternal purpose is the full revelation and dispensation. What dispensation means is the giving, the administration, the administration of themselves to and in all things. I put that in capital letters because it's all things, you have to create it. Because before this time, God was all and all. There was nothing but God. But now, God has an agenda to reveal and dispense himself to all things which he has to create. So that he will be all in all. He will be everything in everything. Before then, God was everything and everything. There was nothing else but God. But now, God will make things and then God will give himself to them and reveal himself fully in them so that he will be all in all. So this arrangement is what necessitates the production which is actually a Generation by derivation from themselves. 
Because there's no, there's no, there's only God. So whatever God wants to make, He is the raw material. It will have to come out of Him. Because there's only Him. They will have to generate by the revelation of themselves things other than themselves. And these things include the first creation, which you know as the old creation, and then the new creation, or the second creation. These two things, the first creation and the old creation, they will have been produced in eternity. In the eternal purpose of God, God finished everything. You know, the Bible says that this mystery in Christ was completed before the world began. The Bible says Christ already slain before the world began. It was done. So everything we see play out in time has already been finished in this eternity. This eternity. It's done. That's why Jesus said, I am the beginning and the end. At the beginning, you meet me. At the end, when it comes everything, you come back here. Because we finished it here before we started anything. That was why God was confident to create Adam. Because he already had a solution for created him. Because Adam made a very momentous decision when he decided to depart from God. That was a very serious one. If God had a solution, he won't try that risk. Because God did not design hell for any human being. But human beings would go to the of fire. Even though it was not designed by God because of that decision. If they introduced a strange element into existence. Sin is a strange element. But God was not afraid. It's when you love to create. If you are a painter or an artist or a creative person, you, you don't because of the fact that something can happen to your painting, not paint because you love to paint. Somebody can just mistakenly carry that to your canvas and throw it on the floor. Mistakenly to break. You are not going to stop painting because of that. You know there is a risk but you still paint because you love it. God created because of his pleasure. There's something about God that loves to create. So he, he won't, because of a risk, not be himself. But it was a very important, that thing Adam did was serious. But God already had his solution. So God was not disturbed. God was not disturbed by that because before the foundation of the world, the Lamb of God had already been slain. Redemption was already a reality before the first scene of angels. It was already existing in eternity. It was a mystery hidden God. That dimension of God that exists is hidden is in this dimension. In the exclusive dimension, there's no war. It, it is in the inclusive dimension, but it's also eternity, like I explained earlier. Amen. Mm -hmm. Daddy has already encouraged me to what he said. No, no, they may have to understand more. Okay. So I'm encouraged. I'll just continue. <laughs> so this, the first creation, the old, everything before God said, let there be anything, he finished it first in Christ. He finished creation, he finished salvation in Christ Jesus. Eternity, which is called the beginning. Just to confirm that to you, Proverbs chapter 8. Just to confirm that, Proverbs chapter 8. There is an eternity which is called the beginning. That is not time. Proverbs chapter 8, let me bring out that scripture. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I have a few minutes left. I'm going to use it very well by the grace of God. Proverbs chapter 8. This is Christ speaking here as the wisdom of God. Remember, the Bible makes us know that Christ has made to us the wisdom of God and the power of God. Let me read from verse 21. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. Now, if you read that in the literal Hebrew, what is actually said there is the Lord possessed me the beginning of his way. Not in the beginning of his way. That's why you see some trans. I don't know whether the ESV captures it. ESV or literal translation, young literal, but you still know you see the Lord possessed me the beginning of his way. So I am the beginning of his way. Okay, let's go on. It says, before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting. Did you get that? Was set up in the Greek means I was anointed or appointed. I was anointed, meaning I was, I was the Christ from everlasting. He's describing himself as the beginning of God's will. The beginning. This is so the Christ is the origin of all things and is the ending of all things. Everything was finished in the Christ before God started in me, before it manifested. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was. So the beginning there is called everlasting. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning. So the beginning there is everlasting. So I was set up from everlasting is equivalent to I was set up from the beginning. Because the Lord is speaking about himself as the beginning of God's way. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen. There is an entity called the beginning. He is the beginning. 
But before that reality, is 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 like that is where they are disclosed. That the moment they decide to be disclosed in that eternal reality, the beginning has come. But before then, they're exclusive and there's there's no there's no they're not coming out to them. They are just being themselves. I'm just trying to make you if you can follow my picture, you are seeing the exclusive go ahead decide at the point that we want to become revealed. That moment of stepping out of exclusivity to make themselves become available in revelation is called the beginning. It is not a time, it is an existence. So the father, so in this place, the son is not just the son now, the son is the Christ. That's where we have the arrangement of God's purposes and all that. Here is the Christ. He is the son of the Christ is the son of God. But the Christ is the upper. Oh my God, I'll get there, I'll get there. I'll get there. I'll get there. I'll get there. I'm just, I'm just reading the scripture to make you understand that there is an eternity which is called the beginning. Then there is an eternity that they say it has no beginning of days, no end of life. So you can't define that eternity in the context of beginning. It's describing the existence of the Son of God. That's Hebrews chapter 7. But here, he's describing the Son as the beginning of God's way before his works of old. So he's talking about the Son in the context of God's work, of God's, God's the revelation of God. Before he's going, he's, 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 he's doing his wonders to reveal himself the beginning of his way. God took a path. He took a journey to make himself known. So, in that reality, he says, I was set up, I was anointed from everlasting. From the beginning, before the end was. So, what he calls everlasting, he, in another breath, calls the beginning. This is Christ speaking as the wisdom of God. Because Bible makes us know the that Christ is the wisdom of God. So when you see wisdom speaking, and wisdom says, I am this, I am that. If you look at everything, it's really Jesus. He said, the Lord delighted me. He said, I, I, my, my delight was with the sons of men. This is Jesus. But in his eternal you, from speaking as the wisdom of God. When there were no deaths, I was brought forth. So you can see that in this reality, he's brought forth into it. He's brought forth into it. There's a, there's a reality where this is not, does not exist. He is not in this capacity. He's, but that realm is excluded. Do you know Jesus is called two things in with respect to his sonship? Jesus is called the only begotten and the first begotten. And Jesus is always half. He's always the only begotten. He's, there has not stopped being the only begotten. There's a sense in which Jesus is exclusive. He's exclusively the son, his only begotten. The only begotten who is into the bosom. Who is into the one in there is into it. Who is in the bosom of the Father, not who was, who is in the bosom. He's always there. He has declared him. So Jesus says, No one knows the Son except the Father. So there's a way in which the Father knows Jesus that you can never know him. It's exclusive to the Father. It's their exclusive privilege. That is Jesus as the only begotten. But this, so whenever you see the word only begotten, only begotten speaks, emphasizes the reality of the Son as deity in his person. The son is also the first begotten. And as first begotten, there is now participation of both creation because it's the first born of creation. And then of the body of Christ because it's the first born of the church. That is the reality of the son where you have inclusion. First means there are others. That is what the son of God is as the Christ. Because that's, that's an official reality. That's not it. That's not an exclusive that all those things are because of the work he has to do. First born from the dead. First born of creation. You can see it's connected to us. It's connected to us. Only begotten. Only begotten is only begotten. Only begotten of the Father. You can see with the connection. It's not connected to you. It's connected to the Father. So when you understand this, you will worship Jesus. Jesus is God. You say, you know, Jesus, Jesus, and I know Jesus is just a party. You, know, ah, you don't know Jesus. When one man saw him, he put his finger in his hands and put his hands in his side. And the revelation put forth in his spirit. And he cried, My Lord and my God. This is a man that they had been living in for three They slept in the same rooms. They, this, this man, they had gone to the toilet in their presence. And this man is crying, My God. What did he say? Hmm. It's called the revelation of Jesus Christ. That, that's why Paul said, I saw him by revelation. I know the essence of this being. Because Paul met this being and said, Who are you, Lord? No, he didn't know who he was. He just knew that this thing I've met, sorry, using the word thing, this is my maker. He taught the frequency of life and said, This is deity. 
And he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth. What? That was the, that was the most radical day in Paul's life. Because all his life, to that point, in fact, he was the first major terrorist in the scriptures. Anti, Anti-Christ, anti-Gospel terrorist. Paul was the first. He was the major sworn, open sworn enemy of God, of Jesus. Of God, Jesus. Because he thought that they were lying. Because he was a Pharisee. The Lord of our God is one God. And they've interpreted that to mean that God is just one person. No. I'm already teaching things that will explain it now. So let me just share them now. So when Paul, when Paul met him, he said, that was how Paul discovered that Jesus is the image of God. Because he met a being and met God. And that, that being told him I'm Jesus. So you know, oh, 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 Jesus is the person that God gives you so that you can see the God here. That's why I talked about the inheritance of the saints in the light. There was somebody in that light that day that he met. He met him. He said, I have seen Jesus. I have seen him. Of course, Jesus appeared to him, but that's what I'm saying. He, he touched that thing. There was some, his spirit contacted. Ah! Say, this is my maker. Say, yes, I am Jesus. Mm. So Jesus is not just one guy there. Who is, Jesus became a man. See, let me say something. The humanity of Jesus is adopted. It is not essential. Essentially, Jesus is deity. Jesus became a man and adopted humanity to into his person for our sakes. Originally, Jesus is not a man. God is not a man that is will die. That is not a man that is will die. He's not a man. But he has become a man. That's the mystery of incarnation. That's the mystery of, mystery of Emmanuel. God with us. Ha! The world became flesh and dwelt among us. That's man. He came into our realm of reality. He came into our realm. Not that he was living on the earth. He came into our world. He can understand human passions, human feelings, the human world. He understands it because he came to our realm. For instance, in this place, there might be a mosquito, there might be a cockroach, there might be an ant, but you are not in its world. You can't understand why, how the ant will go about and be carrying sugar. You, you, you. For you to do that, you have to become an ant. So we can be in the same place, but we're not in the same world. Mm. We're all in this room, but we're not in the same frequency. Same frequency of existence. For instance, now with this light, now you will start seeing that there are rays. I mean, there are particles that are vibrating here. The more intense the light, the more you see the particles. So those particles are here together with us. As I'm breathing in now, they are, they are entering inside, they are coming out particles. But you can't see them. And you, you, you are not immediately conscious of them until something makes you become conscious of them. You have your own world. You can be here now, you are thinking about something in America. You, that, that's, that you can do that. Well, couples can't do that. But they are all in the same room. Different worlds. So Jesus came into our world. He can relate with you. Jesus knows what it means to be. But essentially is God. But he has adopted humanity so that he can be revealed to men. Amen. Amen. Do you understand that? Okay. So the production of all things. Hallelujah. So the so so I'm just trying to make you see that there was an arrangement where God finished the program. The eternal purpose of God, which was purposed in Christ Jesus. God finished the mystery before the foundation of the world. He purposed it in Christ and completed it and locked it on that seed in Christ Jesus and kept that dimension of Christ as a mystery. That was the reason why nobody, that was why, the reason why Satan could not decipher the cross. Satan could not understand the cross because the cross was not privy. Angels were not privy to the cross. The cross was a mystery to angels. And when God created the angels, there was a dimension of himself, his mystery, called Christ Jesus. That God kept. So the princes of this world did not understand both the human experts and the spiritual experts, the spirit beings, they do understand. These are beings who have eyes within and without. They do understand. To today, they still long to look into the gospel because it's a mystery to them. Because God kept it as a secret in Christ Jesus. So God is a very terrible being. God can stand here and be shaking you, and that being is hidden from you. you. That's why I have to tell Moses, Moses, let me not deceive you. You won't see me today, yet you see me. Because if you, if I don't tell you that you didn't see me, you will live here thinking you saw me. Because you will see me, you have an encounter. Your face will shine. But you are not going to see my face. Ah. What am I not going to see? Your back part. My, my back part. So but that back part is set this glory. So I know. I know. But I'm just, I just need to inform you so that you will not be deceived. Because you can see me and not see me. Mm-hmm. Oh, now that I hide death thyself. That says God covered it. Hide death himself with light. Covered himself with light as a garment. Ah. You can imagine. How can you hide yourself? God is light and covers himself with light. So one light is covering another light. So you are interacting with a face and you say, oh, I'm seeing God, I'm knowing God. That's what I'm the Old Testament. Do you know that the Old Testament revelation of God is a shadow? But it's real. It's not fake. Shadow doesn't mean a lie. Shadow doesn't mean a lie. 
An idol is a false god. But Jesus said, I have come to make you know the true God. Not that the Old Testament did not have the, the three persons of God. No, the persons of God are in the Old Testament. Is that the reality in their revelation is a shadow. So when Jesus says the true God, he's not talking in the context of idols because he's speaking to Jews. He's not, going to, he's not talking in the context of idols. He's saying that until I show up to reveal God, whatever you know of God is a shadow. That's why John can say, John chapter 1 verse 18, no one has seen God. The word in the literal Greek is nothing has seen God. Not no man, nothing, nothing. Including the angels that have eyes with without. That means there are dimensions in God. And that's why we must even be careful as people because the knowledge of God is progressing. If you go and read John chapter 3 verse 16 today, the kind, the way you see that verse is not the way you saw it being God again. Ah, was this thing there? Give yourself another five years of working with God. Read John 3 16 again. When the Holy Ghost will preach on us, ah, you mean this is there? You know, sometime ago, a few years ago, I discovered that Jesus defined the whole content of salvation in John 3 16. Mm -hmm. Everything about salvation that they should not perish but have eternal life. That is salvation. But we just apply, oh, you not know, perish, you get born again, we'll have eternal life. In fact, we won't have eternal life, then we'll just we'll go to heaven and live forever, we'll go to heaven. Until we now discover that people who will live forever in hell. Eternal life is not about living forever. It's a quality of life that is exclusively God's, which he wants to share with you. So eternal life is what we are experiencing for now. We don't wait to heaven to enjoy eternal life. Amen. 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 I'm, I'm already explaining all of the stuff, so let's just move. So the work is the official revelation and giving of, the, of themselves to be all in all in things other than themselves, that is not as things that are not essentially themselves. Not this official revelation. So everything we are dealing with here is official in their, their offices. Offices that they enter into for the purpose of making themselves reveal to things that are not themselves. They don't, they don't have a problem with revealing themselves to themselves. They are enjoying that in their exclusive trinity. But they say, we have to make ourselves available to things that are not ourselves. So we have to enter an official arrangement. That official arrangement is what brings the Father, I mean, the puts, makes the Father become the God, and the Son become the Lord, and the Holy Ghost become the Spirit in the context of an office. There is, the Holy Ghost has the Spirit in the context of his personal operation. There is also the Holy Ghost has the Spirit in the context of his office. The Spirit. And I, we're going to explore that now. So this, in this um, in inclusive trinity, we are dealing with the deity in the official arrangement to be known by and in all things, which is, that is, the created. What the created? First question, second creation. This is the only reality in which they can be known by all things, and that which is known in this reality is what they really are. So in the official reality, in the inclusive reality, this is the only way we can know them. But the good thing is this, what we know them to be, when we interact with them with the official trinity, is actually nothing but a, a, a true and accurate revelation of their essence. So we are actually knowing them for real. So I sum it up by saying the exclusive is revealed in the inclusive for the participation and the enjoyment of all things. That's the whole point of the exclusive trinity becoming the inclusive trinity. Becoming not in the sense of, you know God can change form, but he can't change his essence. For instance, Jesus was in the form of God and removed that form with his eternal, eternal glory of equality with God and then took upon himself the form of his servant. He didn't change his essence as God, but he changed his form, the, 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 the mode in which he exists. He can change it. So he can come as a suffering servant and then he can come back, be coming back as a glorious Lord. And I'm wondering, he's not the same person. God can change his form, but he can't change his essence. And he appeared to them in another form. He can do that, but he can't change his essence because his essence is that that life is eternal. Do you understand? It can't, it can't, it's, also, it's always remains the same. Thou art the same, thy years are not fail. So we find. Alright. Okay, so why please when you go back to the slides, you can just check through the scriptures and just read through them. Some of them are already put in, but I want to move so that I will get where we are supposed to go. So now we're dealing with the inclusive trinity. Remember I said that in, in the inclusive trinity, we are dealing with the trinity in their official arrangement. What did I say? Official arrangement. And the purpose of this official arrangement is to make them become this revealed to us. It's for us that they are this, not for themselves. This is for the purpose of revealing themselves to things that are not themselves which they have to create and which they created and all that. So, 
In the arrangement of their offices, we have three offices in the Godhead. We have the office of the God. This is not, now hear this, hear this, hear this. Because this is one place that sometimes one misunderstand in the New Testament. When you hear, for instance, blessed be the God, and grace and peace be to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He's speaking of them in the context of their office. Because it is from their offices we receive grace and peace. So that is saying the Father is God and Jesus is Lord, it doesn't mean Jesus is not also God essentially. This is talking about an official arrangement. There are three offices. The, the office of the God. The, and they have distinct functions. The office of the Lord. And then the office of the Spirit. This is what you saw revealed in um, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 when we read that. There are different diversities of gifts, but one Spirit. There are diversities of administrations, but one Lord. There are diversities of operations, but one God. But the same God. It's, that is official. Because that's in the context of work. It's in this context you have submission. In the essential exclusive trinity, what you have, the only reality that's present is equality. In that way, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, they are equal. That's all. But in the inclusive trinity, you have equality and subjection, submission. So they are equal, yet they are serving one another. So Jesus and the Father know, God know that Jesus is equal to the Father. Yet Jesus puts himself under subjection for the purpose of the work. The Holy Ghost knows, and they know that the Holy Ghost is equal to them. Yet the Holy Ghost puts himself under the authority of Jesus. So you have the Father, the Lord, then the Spirit. The God, the Lord, then the Spirit. That is how they are able to administer their realities to us. If they didn't enter a realm, then we won't know them. We won't. We won't know them. So we must be able to know what terrain are you dealing with. So that doesn't work that Jesus is not God. But what scriptures clearly say Jesus is God. Yeah, people scripture also say Jesus is subject to God. How, how do you understand you have to be able to navigate? What context are you dealing with? Because there are offices. We can all be friends, but if we start a company and I'm the CEO and you are you are the um, maybe you are the um, COO and another person is the CFO, there are different offices. And we may have different salaries, but we are friends, we are only poor, we are, but we have an arrangement in that office. And we have to, if we want that office to prosper, we have to abide by our offices. You can't say because you're my friend, and you are the CEO, and I'm the CEO, you want to usurp my authority as the CEO. In the context of our personal relationship, we are friends, but in the office, I am CEO, you are CEO. We have an official relationship. And if we really love ourselves and want our agenda to succeed, we have to be faithful to our official relationships, not just our personal relationships. And there's a lot of times people don't know how to differentiate between how to balance this. There's a difference between personal relationship and official relationship. There's a difference. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. So it's important for us to understand this arrangement. Did, did you get that? So for instance, Stephen, let's say that, you know, for instance, like a family business. So husband and wife decide to do a family business, for instance, I'm doing that. But now in the business, because of the, maybe the kind of business and all, the person has the skill and has the capacity, maybe the wife is the MD of the company, because maybe it's an advertising or it's an IT company, and the wife is an IT specialist and all that. Meanwhile, the husband maybe is a management person. He knows how to manage and organize people, so he's more, maybe like he's the, he's the maybe HR, and the wife is the MD. Now, in the home, the wife is the head. I mean, the husband is the head of the wife. But in that office, the, uh, is, is the wife is the boss of the husband. And if they, if they love their lives and they want that business to prosper, they will have to. Because official reality is being you, people are, you put people in offices, you should put people in offices based on capacity, official capacity. You can't say because you're the husband, you have no business, you, have not, you don't know anything about IT, you don't know, and you say you want to be the CEO of the IT company because you're the husband. If you love their family business and want it to prosper, you play to each person's strength. That's what you do. And you maintain that official arrangement. When you now come home, uh -huh, the arrangement changes. Because it's personal. But when you enter the office, ah, ah, yeah, this is another, this is what the MTC. Ah, but it's your wife, why can't you talk to her? Ah, this is about our wife. We, we, husband and wife will not put money inside this business. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to bring it to us. You know? So for instance, uh, Stevie, you, we can be friends. You know, we're friends, bodies and all that. And then we decide to contest elections, Nigerian presidency. 
Then he becomes the president, I became vice president. And in the matter of office, he's my boss now. This is my party, that maybe I'm even, this is my party, but in the matter of office. So there are things that will be on his table that won't be on my table. There are things I will be reporting to him, good morning, sir. When, when, when we are having official meeting, I, you know, I salute as the president or whatever it is I have to do, even though it's my party. Because it's an official matter now. Because the office is put in place, is institutionalized so that what the goals we want to achieve will be achieved. It's bigger than just, just we just, you know, uh, rolling together as friends. So the God had to have that arrangement. So there are three offices. The Father operates the office of the God. And that's why you see, anytime you, anytime you see that, like I said, if you read the New Testament, great. Anytime you talk about the God, the person of the Father, put that article there, the God, the God. Jesus Christ is the Lord, the Lord. Then the Holy Ghost operates the office called the Spirit. It's an office. After the Father, okay, let me continue. Now, the official reality, yes. Official reality is, this is the thing about them that gives them the capacity to, step, to stand in that office. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is the, so for instance, for you to be the Let's say they say for you to be the MDC or Medi Services Community Hospital, you have to have a PhD in this, a master's in this, you get between. You have all those qualifications. But I can give you an example. In, our, in the medical field, there's what you there's what we know as a fellow. A fellow is somebody who has he has gone through, after he has graduated from medical school, he's gone through residency training, he finishes the first part, he becomes a member of the college. Then by the time he finishes the second part, he becomes a fellow of the college. Now, a fellow of the college is like he has finished the training. From there on, if you want to be anything, you enter the academia and then you become a, a associate professor or professor. That's in the academia. But we're talking about in the medical practice, in the practice. So you have a member and then you have a fellow. When you have finished and gotten your qualification as a fellow, you are a fellow. That's all you are. Now, because you are a fellow, you can now be employed by a hospital to be a consultant pediatrician. A consultant pediatrician is an official, is an office in a hospital. It is not something you are because you read medicine. What you are because you read pediatrics and became a specialist in pediatrics is you are a fellow, you are not a consultant. Any hospital can employ you to become a consultant. But you see, you have to be a fellow before you can be employed as a consultant. You can't, they can't employ me. Or they can't employ somebody who has not gone through that residence training to become a fellow. They can't employ him as a consultant. It doesn't matter how steep or how good you are. You have to have that qualification. That being a fellow is the official reality that makes it possible for you to be employed into that office. Do you understand? So the God here, are you listening to me? For them to, to, to operate these offices, there are realities that they are. There are things that they, they decided to become, as it were, in eternity, of, in eternity of their eternal purpose, so that they could administer these offices. For the Father, for the office of the God, what the Father is that helps you to perform this office is called the Father. That's why you keep saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The God and Father. The God speaks of the office. The Father speaks of the capacity by which he's able to uh, uh, operate that office. Grace and peace from God, our Father. And from Jesus Christ our Lord. He's speaking of them in the context of their offices. But now you can see that you can you now see that it is their persons that are being revealed in their offices. So now, here when you call him the Father, unlike in the deity, where he's in the deity, in the exclusive trinity, he's simply the source, the author of the God life. Here, he is the author of everything that has to do with the agenda. Not just not this, it's not about the God life here. It's about, it's the author of creation, it's the author of the blueprint of creation, of the blueprint of salvation. So it's called the father of all things. The author of all things. Here. It's not about their lives. Are you with me? Are we together? Now, the official reality that makes the son able to occupy and operate the office of the Lord is that he is the Christ, the anointed. The Christ is the reality of the Son in his official capacity that enables him to, him to stand in that office of the Lord and do the work of that office. If the Son is not the Christ, he cannot operate the office of the Lord. 
If the Father is not the Father of all things, he can't operate the office of the God. So also the Spirit. The official reality that the Holy Ghost comes into to be able to operate that office called the Spirit is called the seven spirits of God. So in the Holy Ghost, for the Holy Ghost to be able to operate his office as the Spirit, he becomes the seven spirits. So your prints are seven eyes and seven horns, which are the seven spirits of God. Set for the earth. The eyes of the Lord run to and for the earth to show himself strong official. To those who to those whose hearts are perfect toward him. You can see this is the dimension of the Holy Ghost that is in con 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 communication with us. So the Holy Ghost there is the seven spirits of God. So that seven spirits of God that he is, is the capacity required to be able to perform the function of that office called the Spirit. Right, when I finish this, I will read two scriptures. Now, the official function. What is the official function of that office of the God? The, offic the official function of that office of the God is provision. Because that office is the generating, because the person by nature is a generator. That office is the office responsible for generating and providing everything that has to do with the God of the God. God, the office of the God is what's responsible. So the Father in that office is the person responsible for determining what is to be done, what is to be accomplished, what is to be had. And, and they have to do this because they have to arrange this, make this arrangement so that the work will prosper. So it is his own responsibility to provide by generating. So whatever it is that God wants to build, if God wants salvation to happen, God wants creation to happen, then this office is what's responsible for providing what will be created. Providing the blueprint and the agenda. If one salvation to happen, is one responsible for providing the grace and everything that the blueprint and that agenda. The office of the Lord, which the Christ occupies, is the office responsible for administration. 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 So everything that is provided by the office of the God is administered by the office of the Lord. He is the one responsible for how it will go. Okay, the agenda is to save man. How will we save man? Okay, I will become flesh. I will be the how. He's, he's, that's, his, that's his office. He's the administrator. So everything is provided by the Father is kept in the storehouse called the Lord. Everything that is provided by the God is kept in the storehouse called the Lord. All things are now by the Lord. But all things are of the Father. They are of the God. That is in that, the Father in that office. But they are by the Lord. So the function of the office of the Lord is admission. Now let's say if you understand this, you understand the, the, the godly persons that are doing what? So for instance, you hear Paul say, Paul and Apostle are going to the will of God. So in your ministry, God is the one that determines the mandate. The, the person, the office of the God is what determines what's the mandate of your ministry. Based on the mandate of your ministry, Jesus now looks at you and says, ah, the best resource, the, the best program by which we ought to accomplish this mandate. For instance, oh, there's a mandate. We want the people to go as the first. We want the people to go and carry the message of the gospel to the Gentiles so that the Gentiles will also be saved. To establish a solid foundation for the rest of the Gentiles. God says, ah, so God says, that's what I want to be done. I want the people to come. I want this message to go to the Gentiles. I want, I want, I want people to be saved. And I, I need people that, that will shoulder their responsibility as a foundation for the rest. Others will come after them. Others will build on them. And Jesus now says, if this is what you want to be done, the only way, the best way to go about this is to engage the apostolic resource. You have to make that person become an apostle. Because that, through the office of apostleship, this thing you want to do, be accomplished. Then the Holy says, ah, yes, you see that? Now, to accomplish apostleship, you need a certain kind and texture of grace. So the Holy Ghost will come and give that grace for apostleship. Then the one who has not been given the grace for apostleship will not be able to, in the name of that grace, go on and carry that. That's why Paul said, I am not looking for a place where they have preached Christ. I'm an apostle. I look for where they have not preached Christ. I will live on this one. That's my work. So the three persons of the Trinity contribute their part to what is happening here. This is over The work of the Holy Ghost, the office of the Spirit, with the seven spirits occupies, with the Holy Ghost occupies as the seven spirits. That office is responsible for manifestation. Oh, God will keep dreaming without this, this and nothing will happen without this office. If there's no the spirit, if the Holy Ghost does not occupy this office of the spirit, God will be dreaming big dreams. They will never see the light of day. 
The Holy Ghost in this office is responsible for the manifestation of anything. So for instance, in creation, God said, I, I want there to be light. Right? Jesus gave the command because all things were created by the word. So the Father communicates what he wants. He wants light to the Son. Then the Son utters it. Because it's by, he opposes all things by the word of his power. So it's the Son that telling me the utterance. Right? According to Hebrews chapter 1, it is the Son that made the utterance. Because the one that is upholding all things by the word of his power is the Son. The rima of his power. So, after making the utterance, let there be light. If the Holy Ghost is not involved, you won't see light. The Holy Ghost is the one that literally takes the word that was spoken by Jesus. That's why the word of God is called the soul of the spirit. It's the spirit that uses it. The spirit will take that word and bring light to manifestation. It will convert the word to light. That is the work of the office of the spirit. His work is manifestation. Are you with me? Yeah, hold on. I'm explaining this so that by the time we read the scriptures, I want to say it. I'm we'll explaining it here. And then, so provision, administration, manifestation. Now, official activity. Now, the official function. So you have an office, for instance, in an office, there is the pharmacy department, there is the hospital, there is the pharmacy department, there is the medical department, you know, there is the uh, 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 laboratory department, and all those departments. So they are offices. So they have, so what is the, what is the work of the medical department? The medical department is responsible for seeing the patients, consultation, treatment, you know, them doing operations, the interview, and all those things is their responsibility. That's, that's what the office is for. For providing care and ensuring that, you know, making diagnosis, providing care and ensuring that, you know, patients are treated properly and all that. You get the ultimate response, right? What is the work of the pharmacy department? What the pharmacy department is to make sure that the drugs that are, the drugs are available, the drugs are quality, the drugs that have been prescribed, the ones that are administered, and then ensure, ensuring that they follow up on all those things to make sure that everything is well, right? So they have official functions. Now, but inside those functions, inside those offices who have clear functions, there are certain activities that they carry out that will fulfill the functions of those offices. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, for instance, the doctor being responsible for, for ensuring that the patient diagnosis is made and, and treatment, proper treatment is administered, he has an official activity. One of his official activities is seeing the patient, clerking the patient. So that's why it's one that discusses with the patient, gets down, writes down, takes down this and that, comes to make a diagnosis and he recommends investigations and all that. That is, that's an official activity because of his office. Then, if the operation is needed to be done, he goes to the theater and gets the operation. Do you know what I'm saying? That's, those are activities of that office. Just like the pharmacy department, we will receive the prescription, they will dispense it, they will tell you, okay, this is how you take it, once, twice, daily and all that. They give that explanation, that counsel. Why? Because they are responsible that office is responsible for that. But there are activities within that office that make for the functionality, the proper functioning of that office. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, in these offices, who are functions? So, God's function is to provide. How does he provide? In what activity does he provide? It's called generation. He offers it. For the office of the, of the Lord, how does he administer things? The office of, of the Lord, who is the administrator, Performs the work of administration by authorization. So for, I'll give you a scripture version. And then the Holy Ghost, the office of the Spirit, who is the who occupies this office, office as the special spirit. Now, when he wants to bring something in, into manifestation, the way he gets it done is by execution. He executes it. He's the doer. Do you get it? So let me give you an example. John chapter 1, verse 12. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Do you agree with that? Even them that even to them that believe on his name, right? Do you agree with that? For as many as what received him, to them gave him power to become the sons of God. Who are those that received him? Even them that believe in his name, right? Now, so God decided to make all of us sons. So God sent Christ to the earth, and in his days in the flesh, by his spirit, he led him. And he went to the cross and did everything. And in Christ, the Father has provided sonship for all humanity. Any human being right now can be a son of God. The Father has provided it. He's already done. The Father has made it available. That's what happened almost 2,000 years ago. The provision has been done because the Father took, sent the Son to the earth, taught the Son, equipped the Son, gave him knowledge, gave him understanding, sent him to the cross, empowered him. He died. He rose, raised him from the dead, and enthroned him. That was the Father's work. He provided adoption for all men. Jesus, on the other hand, the adoption that has been provided for you is in Christ Jesus. You can't by pass and say, Father, please, I would like to be adopted. The Father doesn't know what you're talking about. Everything that has to do with what I have for you is now in the person called Jesus. 
If you are not going to meet Jesus, don't come to me. That's why any person that does not believe in Jesus now does not believe in God. Anyone who denies the witness of Jesus he does not believe the record that God has born concerning son. That's why you know there are some different kind of you know religions and people that believe that Jesus is not. You don't understand. There's a reason you have to believe Jesus is not God. If you don't believe that, you cannot be saved. Because it is as the son and in this office of the Lord that he is the he is the heir of all things. He is the possessor of everything. Everything the Father wants you to have, He gave it to Jesus. He gave He didn't give it to directly. He gave it to Jesus. It is as a joint heir with Christ. You come to partake of everything God wants for your own life. Yeah, you cannot question this because Jesus occupies this office. There's something you cannot want it. Everything that will come, from, that's why it's called the kingdom of our God and of His Christ. There's nothing you cannot want it. Whatever salvation, healing, deliverance you want now from God, it has to come through the office of the Christ. It has to come through. In fact, He, he created by Christ. There's nothing you can do. Is that mystery? So now adoption is available. It has been provided for you. Salvation has been provided for every human being in Christ. But you see, if Christ does not administer it to you, you are still not saved. Even though God has saved the payment in Christ. So what? How do you get to be saved? Jesus has to authorize your salvation. He has to authorize your salvation. Even though the salvation, your salvation has been placed inside him. For you to get it, it's like saying that in that office, if that office does not sign, nothing will move out. No, app, no release of funds, no disbursement of funds. All the funds are kept inside Jesus. All the riches of the glory of God's grace that's provided salvation, deliverance, everything in, in, in the, for God is all in Christ. So if Christ does not disp- disburse it, if Christ does not authorize the disbursement, you will die in sins and trespasses. The office of the Lord. So what happens is that he has to Authorize the disbursement of salvation. So, for instance, when you go to Jesus and you repent, you say, Oh, I believe in Jesus. I want to be born again. I want to have my sins washed away. I want to be made new. Now, when you say that, Jesus must validate what you are saying. He looks at your heart and says, There's faith there. He's basically just talking because of that question. There's faith. Now, when he sees faith, he says, I hereby authorize the salvation. What's your name, sir? Sorry, sir. Yes. I hereby authorize the salvation of. Brother, are your ditch. So once Jesus signs on it, he has he has done his work. You know what now happens? The Holy Ghost now comes with the water of the world. It's the Holy Ghost that now comes and regenerates you. So though Jesus gave you power, the word power in the Greek here is authority, exousia, to become the Son of God. It is the Holy Ghost that literally made you a Son of God. You are born of the Spirit. Except the man be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Ah, how is this man get born again? Does he have to enter his mother's No, no, he's not born of death. Except man born of water and spirit. It's not water and of the spirit. It's water and spirit in the Greek. That, uh, that activity happens together. The Holy Ghost uses the water of the world to regenerate you. For that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So, the way you are born again, or born from above, the word again is exactly above. The way you are born from above is actually you are born by this spirit. So, who gave birth to you? Come, come, literally, it was the Holy Ghost. But on whose authority? Jesus' authority. Where did that come from? How is that possibility available? The Father provided it. This is how they operate in their offices. So the Father is not going to, for, for billion eternities, come down and come and quicken you when you confess the Lord Jesus. The Father will not do that. As I said, what? He has provided it. The Son is not going to, the Son will not do that. When he sees faith, because the basis of authorization is faith. When Jesus sees faith, because he cannot force anything to you. When he sees faith, he authorizes that he flows. So see, the only one that comes with the power and does the literal quickening. So you are quickened by the Spirit on the authority of the Son as provided by the Father. Do you get it? This is how you are praying. Guys, you see that? The Trinity is practical. It's practical. It's practical. So execution. Now, let me read some scriptures so that you, because I've been saying a lot. Let's read scriptures. Now, give me 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse, verse 6. Thank you, Jesus. So I have a slide there where there are all scriptures, you can look at them. So that's why I, I put the scriptures so that they will not be cumbersome. And they come see in this in the right. So first Corinthians chapter 8. Let's see that. First Corinthians 8, verse 6. For us, yes. There is but one God. For but to us, who are the us there? Believers. Though there be many gods in the world and many lords, and to many that are you know different. And even in the Old Testament, God called the angels gods and lords. Stephen. But there is 
But to us there is but one God. But to us there is but one God. The Father. The Father. Who is the God? The Father. Did you see that? Here he's not speaking about their essence. He's speaking about their offices, by which they administer their realities to us. To us there is one God, and that God is the Father. This is what some people take and used to say that Jesus is not God. Then if they say Jesus is not God, they have to now open first. I mean, Titus chapter two verse thirteen that literally says that Jesus is our God as in him. So how do you reconcile that? You have to to separate when he's talking about them in essence and when he's talking about them in office. This is office. To us, there is one God who is the Father. So what it takes for him to be able to operate that office of the God is that he has to be Father. Yes, sir. Of whom are all things. Yes. And we in him. Now, do you notice that? Of whom? So the office of the God which is operated by the Father, is what's responsible for the generation of all things. Of whom are all things. That's why I call him the Father of all things. Of whom are all things. And we him. The word in there in the Greek is translated wrongly in it. It's actually, and we are to him. The word in there is unto him. So all things are of the Father, and all things are unto the Father. They came from him, they go back to him. Did you get that? That is, what, that is what that office is responsible for. In that office, all that office devotes itself to is providing everything, generating everything. So to be able to do that, in that work of that office, you have to be the father to do that. The father, not, just, not father is the exclusive deity now, but you have to be the father of all things. You have to know how to provide grace or provide salvation, provide all the things. The provider of all things, of whom are all things, and we who receive the all things are to him. Everything being flows out from him and everything goes back to him. Yes, sir. And we in him. Yes, sir. And one Lord, Jesus Christ. To us, there is one Lord. Can you see it? Oh, my brethren, can you see it? Yes. There is one Lord. One Lord. This is the office. Who is this Lord? Jesus Christ. So to be able to operate that office, he has to be Christ Jesus. Christ is the Lord of all. He is the Lord. Christ Jesus is the... Let me say it this way. The Son of God has a dimension of himself that is exclusive and he has a dimension of himself that is inclusive. The dimension of himself that is inclusive, that we partake of, that we enjoy, that we benefit from, is that dimension of himself where he is the Christ. Christ Jesus. That's why the gospel which we preach is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We preach the person together with his office because we won't be able to access this person without that office. So there is one Lord and the Lord is Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. By whom are all things by whom all things are we by him. Do you see that? So the purpose of this office is administration. So everything is authored by the Father, but everything is administered by the Son. It's by the Son against you. So if the generator is the Father, but the administrator is the Lord. By him. The Father as the God, the Lord or the Son as the Lord, which is in the, in the reality of the Christ. He operates that office very well. All things are by him. So it's coming from the Father and flowing through him to you. And you too are by him. This is very important if you are going to understand how, what. So there are things within the prices. When Jesus was on earth, Jesus said, told them, said, It is not for you to know. Because we ask for you at this time, restore the kingdom to Israel. He said, I will restore the kingdom, but it's not this time. The issue is that it is not for you to know the times and seasons which the Father speaks in his own power. So there are things in the power of the Father. There are things in the power of the Son. They have their offices. And the files in an office, in this, they belong to a particular office. You can't take people that office and take it somewhere else. So you may want to use it, but you have to return it to where it's supposed to be. The matter of generation, authoring, provision, saucy things comes from the office of the Father, the office of the God, which the, 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 the person of the Father operates as the Father of all things. But the matter of administration, everything by Him, by Him, by Him He made the world. By, you keep saying that it is the Son. The Son is the agency by Him. By Him. By Him. By Him. Why? Because He's the administrator. So say, uh, everything like that, so, say, uh, so the Holy Ghost comes and says, uh, this one believes you. Oh, she just believed in you. She, she has confessed her sins and repented and she has believed in you. Oh! Okay, ah, okay, faith is there. I authorize the salvation. Then the Holy Ghost comes. See, the Holy Ghost simply, the Holy Ghost executes what in that office of the Spirit, what the Lord authorizes. Whatever the Lord authorizes, it is the Holy Ghost that executes. Whatever the Lord authorizes, 
So all things are of the Father. All things are by the, or of the Father in the office of the God. All things are by Christ in the office of the Lord. All things are in the Spirit. They are executed in the Spirit. Because the mystery by which the Holy Ghost gives, executes what, whatever he wants to do, is that mystery called baptism. When the Holy Ghost wants to give you something, the Holy Ghost immerses you into it. He puts you in it and it's in you. That's how, that's how you come. For instance, you became born again, you were baptized into Christ. And then you took on the image of Christ. That's how you became born again. You put on Christ and born again. Then after that, he gives you the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Then you are sealed. Then after that, every other dimension of God, that you, every, any time God will speak a dimension of revelation, so depending on the operation of his own spirit. So at a point, Paul looked at the church and said, ah, when I heard of your faith in, in the Lord Jesus and your love to what he says, I began to pray for you that God will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. It's still the Holy Ghost, but as a spirit. You know, I told you there are seven spirits. The spirit of wisdom and revelation is a dimension of the Holy Ghost. And what that dimension of the Holy Ghost does, that it floods your heart with light. That's what it does. Then there's the spirit of might. What that does, that it strengthens you to be able to execute the light that you got. Because you can have light and not know how to walk in it. Ah, you do the Holy Ghost. So it's a, it's a composite resource for your enjoyment. Very practical. Very useful to your lives. Very useful. I thought we have the Holy Ghost. Why are you still asking the Father to give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation? We have the Holy Ghost. It's in us. And he said that the, Holy, the Father has to, Holy Ghost, we authorize you to, Holy Ghost, you know, through Christ. We authorize you to, so we pray to, so he prays to the Father. The Father tells Jesus that these people are asking for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. You know, you are the one that is in charge. So please, can you stop now? He said, no problem. Ah, it looks at their hearts. Is that prayer of faith? He said, it's a faith. So, Jesus, Holy Ghost, I authorize you to install yourself in them as the spirit of, that working of you as the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Can you activate it in this person? Because the Holy Ghost comes inside you and certain dimensions of his work are not activated in your life. So that you have the Holy Ghost, you need him to be active, you need the full, the seven eyes, and seven, to be full blown or person of the spirit. You need everything. So it's important that we understand these offices, so that we know what to, so grace and peace from our Father as the author, and from the Lord as the administrator. You only see that in the New Testament, they greet you from the Father, the office of the Father and the Son. In the book of Revelation, they now come to them. They greet you from the office of the Father. Him which is which grace and peace multiplied to you from him which is which was and which is God. That's the Father. And then from the seven spirits which are before his throne, that's the Holy Ghost. And then from Jesus Christ, the faithful leader, I mean, the faithful witness and all that. That's, that's the Lord. In Revelation, the three, the three offices are complete. But in the other epistles, you see the emphasis on the first two offices. Because really, the Holy Ghost is just the ex. It's just whatever Jesus authorizes, the Holy Ghost executes. So where the decision is made is. Whether Jesus authorizes or not. Once he authorized, the Holy Ghost does not ask you for anything. Once Jesus authorizes the administration of anything to you, the Holy Ghost comes immediately into your life and comes together. And that's what we, we need to know how to, because when Jesus was going, Jesus entrusted us to the Holy Ghost. We need to know how to work. We need to know the Holy Ghost and to know how to work with him. Otherwise, Christ will be available but inaccessible to you. Without the, you, 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 you don't discover Jesus except in the Holy Ghost. Without the Holy Ghost, you know Jesus. You, do, you don't just know Jesus by reading the Bible. The Holy Ghost has to introduce you to that person. So the Holy Ghost will take the Bible and quicken the Bible. And because the Holy Jesus is a person, Jesus is not literature. He's a person. He's a being. He's an essence that can be revealed, that can be communicated to your heart. And the Holy Ghost is the one that gives you God. So Jesus said, for instance, uh, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profited nothing. And the words that I speak, they are spirit and life. So the spirit is not a quicken it. How will it quicken? The words that I speak, the spirit of life. So when the Holy Ghost wants to give you life, he takes the words of Jesus and gives them to you. He administers those words to you that you believe. If you simply hear Jesus talk and the spirit didn't take those words and quicken or install them in your life, you heard words, but you did not have access. You didn't access what was said. So you heard it. You can even understand the English, but you know nothing. That's why Jesus would tell those guys, you heard not knowing the scripture. I can you say you don't know Because it's the Holy Ghost that gives the communication of these things. Another place where you see the offices that we read that before is in 1 Corinthians 12, where he's describing gifts. There are diversities of gifts. Gifts are powers, they are abilities. He says the, resp the person responsible for ability, because the person who is not responsible for execution, is the spirit. So there's one spirit. There are, there are, vast, there are diversities of, of administrations. The word administration means services, ministries, is, is diaconia, that, that word for where we get taken. There are diversities of services. So, for instance, by the grace of God, I believe that God has 
called them um, that they are a very solid apostolic ministry with a very great evangelistic trust. Now, but his own apostleship is an apostle, but he's a different kind of apostle, for instance, from Apostle Babylon. That's also an apostle and a prophet. That, 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 that's a bit. No, let me let's 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 if Peter comes into a place where there are Jews, and Peter begins to minister, Jews will be saved. But Paul comes there, he's struggling. Jesus told him, get out from Jerusalem, because they won't receive your testimony. He said, ah, if there's anybody they should believe, it's me. And I said, I was not persecuted. He said, it's not by where you were persecuted. It's by the grace I put on your life. Get away from here, I will send you to the Gentiles. Paul was arguing. But when he gets to the Gentiles, oh, he said, I will not dare to speak of the thing that Christ has wrote by me to make the Gentiles obedient. Do you know when the Roman Paul wrote to the Jews, he didn't write to them as an apostle. He's an apostle, but he wrote to them as a brother. Even as our brother Paul has written unto you, Peter said, not as the apostle Paul. Because he's not the apostle to the Jews. It's not just English. It's, a, it's an administration of grace. So you see a man, God then takes the man and sends you to the village. And another person comes and wonder, how are you doing it? In this way, how? Because he, he doesn't carry that grace. He's not, ah, he's not, this is what I bear you, he does have passion. He's what I have passion. It's grace. And I say it this way, every grace has a place. You need to know the territory of your grace. So a man is graced by God and God and enters the finance world and becomes a wonder there. And that same man you put him in sewing to make clothes, fashion designing, he doesn't know what to do. He's, he's, he's competent, he's diligent, but he's not graced for it. So graces, there are different ministries. Different ministries Different, so for instance, there are, there are the prophetic ministry, there are many dimensions, many administrations of the prophetic ministry. In the Old Testament, David was a prophet. David was a prophet. Asaph was a prophet. Elijah was a prophet. Isaiah was a prophet. These three men, they are not alike. The nature of them is, so for instance, Asaph wants to, for Asaph to operate his prophetic, he needs music, he's a musician. So he brings forth his prophetic by music. David operates that too. But David is also on the battlefield working wars. And you want that a prophet? What, what kind of prophet is this one? Then Elijah comes. And he comes from nowhere. Elijah, Elijah the teacher, we don't know him. And he comes and says there will be no rain. And his own dimension is different. When he comes and says, what's that? Then Daniel is a prophet and he's in the king's palace. Daniel, interpreting dreams. There are prophets. Diversities of administrations. The person responsible for that is the Lord. He's the person responsible for that. The dimension of Ministry will function as a minister. The dimension is determined by the Lord. But the mandate that your ministry should perform is determined by the God. God. But you see, based on the dimension of ministry that God wants you to operate, you now are given a particular kind of enablement or gift of grace. That I was explaining. That gift is, is the person responsible for that is the Holy Ghost. Is the one that gives you the empowerment. So the diversity of ministries, God, I mean the Lord, same Lord, that there are diversities of operations or works. But the same God. So God determines what He wants to be done. So God says, I want Nigeria saved. That's the work. Jesus determines the kind of ministries He knows He needs to release to Nigeria based on the based on the nature of Nigeria, the, the nature of the darkness, the hostility in the land and different territories. He knows that the southwest is different from the north. He knows those. So he determines the kind of administration. Then based on whether that's okay, this one will be an apostle with a very strong evangelistic trust. This one will be an apostle with a very strong teacher. You know Paul was an apostle and a teacher. He was a very strong teacher. Very, see his letters. He, he, even his letters, they are, they are written like a dissertation. As somebody is reading it, writing a PhD thesis. Look at the book of Romans. That book, the book of Romans is a, is a wonder. Describing the gospel of God. Kai. But then, that is the dimension of grace. So, based on the way the Lord administers, okay, you go to the northwest, you go to the northeast, you go to the south, you'll be in it. So, it's not about where I want to be in Lagos, I want to go to Canada, I want to be, No, it's God determines where you go. Because He knows what He gave you. Not everybody is going to go to America to minister. We, we need to, there's some, there's some thing. Ministry is where you, a minister, minister is a servant, you do what you're told. So, I, you know, I have a vision. And my vision is that I'm going to go around the world. What if God doesn't have a plan for you? To go outside of that place in Egypt, you say, Look, I'm not a successful minister. Who told you success in ministries is determined by international invitations? Who told you that? John the 
Baptist never left Israel. Yet his apostles were in Alexandria. I mean, sorry, his disciples. Apollos, who was from Alexandria, knew the baptism. How? Lead down to God. John the Baptist baptism traveled far. Yet he never left Israel. Same thing with Jesus. He never left Israel. So let's not have certain idols of no. You do what you are told. You do what you are told. So God says, come to Ipacha, set up apostolic and time for national ministries. Period. And he says, stretch into here. Go out to this. Period. I do what I'm told. Because he's going to mark my script according to what he demanded. You don't serve a person as you please. You serve a person as he pleases. So Paul was like, Jesus said, go to the Gentiles. So when we write the book of Hebrews, I believe he's the one that wrote it. People are right, but I believe it's the one. Because that book is for life. In spirit. Maybe not in language, in spirit. Because ah, that, that is rich. But let's read that. But if you read that, because Peter acknowledges that Paul wrote to the same Jews that Peter was writing to. The Jews scattered in Bithynia, Cappadocia, and all those people. To the strangers scattered there. You get. You know what Paul said? Peter said, Paul, when if, in that book of Hebrews, look how he started. He didn't say, Paul, the apostle of Jesus. I'm not writing as an apostle. If you read Hebrews chapter 13, verse 22, he even says that this book is just a short exhortation. So he was just exhorting them as his brethren. You know, Paul, he Paul had his own personal way. He preferred to preach to the Jews. He, he said, I, I wish myself, I call him, I could wish myself, I call my Christ, from Christ, for my brethren's sake. You know, I, I have someone passion. Yes, you have someone passion and money for the Jews. But your territory of saying this is the Gentiles. Then your learned ones who know not, who don't know the law, who don't know the anything. He said, who do who did not learn do official rabbinical studies. He said, you, go to the Jews. The Jews want power. The Greeks want wisdom. So I will, I will, I will station you accordingly. So you discover that the man, once a man enters, you know, when he sees a crusade, ah, the anointing comes. He's a crusader, like Ida Osa. Ida Osa can pull, because that guy was an apostle with a very strong evangelistic ministry, very strong. He was an apostle. Ida Osa was a government. But some other persons, when he sits in a setting like this, Bible study, oh Jesus, that's why you will know he's anointed. You will be breaking down line upon line, scripture upon scripture. You will be wanting to say, ah, I love his teaching, I love his grace. They're different. Different than, and you don't compare yourself because God does not reward your office, God rewards your faithfulness. It's not your office, it's that you are faithful. So if God gave me one and I reproduce one, I have 100%, just like the guy who gave, God gave five and I reproduce five. If I bring one and I was giving one, and you bring four and you are giving five, in the physical, you may look greater than me. Because you have four, I have one. But in the spirit, ah, my words, I have 100%, you have 80%. So we don't judge by appearances. I don't know how much of grace God gives you. I don't know how much of this. You don't know how much of grace God gives you. You don't know how much of this. Wow, I'm gone, I'm gone. But I believe this, this was helpful. Okay, so let me just show you this slide. And then, so look at here. So I still talk, I'm talking about the persons of the body. Their office, their official rent, their official room. I just want to emphasize their official room. So I already said some of these things before. So the father occupies the office of the God. And in that office, his official reality is the father, and what he does, or what his official role is, is like, the father. The son occupies the office of the Lord, and in that office, he operates in the reality of being the Christ, Christ Jesus, the Christ. And what he does in that office is that he's the heir and possessor of all things. That's why you cannot get anything apart from him. He has to authorize and administer it. Because everything the father ought to, he packages it in the, in, the, in the Christ. He didn't give it to you directly, he gave it to Jesus. So Jesus has to authorize that you get it. And the basis of authorization is faith. And you believe in him, you're authorized to get it. A woman believes so much, you thought you was the powerful flowed out. Because she had fulfilled the conditions for authorization because she believed. So the Father provides out of grace. You don't do it. It's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all within his own prerogative. He provides out of grace. Your prayer is not required, nothing. He did everything, he finished everything. The Son authorizes on the basis of faith. You have to believe that. Then the Holy Ghost gives execution and participation by the mystery of baptism. He will take you and put you inside that and put it in you. That's the I in you and thou in me. That is the fellowship that is unique to us as believers, as sons of God. And that fellowship is only possible in the person of the Holy Ghost. That's the fellowship of sonship. I in you and you in me. That, that is the language of baptism. You are immersed into it. And when you are immersed into it, what you are immersed into feels what is the, the, the principle is dying. You take a, a, a piece of cloth and immerse it through the dye. You immerse it through the dye for the dye for the purpose of the cloth, taking off the dye so that the dye will become the color of the cloth. 
So you were baptized in the Holy Ghost. And when they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, what happened? They were filled with the Holy Ghost. So they entered him, he entered them. So the Holy Ghost, as the person, or the office of the Spirit, in the official reality of the seven spirits. In seven words, I think it's chapter 16, verse 9. If I'm right, if I'm not mixing it up, it says, The eyes of the Lord unto and fully. There's many asking to that, so the Holy Ghost has seven spirits. You saw them go around before. The Father was sitting on the throne, there were 24 others, and there were seven lamps upon the throne, there were seven spirits of God. Later on, you see in Revelation 5, you see that those seven spirits are on Jesus' head. They are the anointing on Jesus, sent forth into all the earth. So the seven spirits of God is the way in which God sent the Holy Ghost into all the earth. And in that office, his work is that he is the revealer, because he responds for manifestation, and the executor of all things. So without the Holy Ghost, nothing can be done. Even if it is God wants it to be done, Jesus has authorized it, the Holy Ghost has to come and do the literal execution of the job. Do you get that? So these are scriptures I've put, sorry, these are scriptures I've put, a lot of these things I've said, concerning the Trinity, concerning the Father and the Son, concerning the Father, concerning the Son, concerning the Holy Ghost, you see them there. So you take those scriptures and go through them, and then I don't, I don't want to put it together with the slide in the table so it's not a concept. So put the scriptures in for you, so you go through everything, you will see it, from step to step. I've quoted some, I've, 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 I've read some. Alright. Now, I have explained this before. Well, I'm almost done. My time is up. Okay. I've gone way beyond time. Okay, just give me less, let me just have, let's say three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes, please. Alright, so, Pastor, is it, is it okay? Yeah. yeah. Now, we have Deity defining realities in the scriptures. Now, there's many attributes of the Godhead, omniscience, omnipotence, and yeah, so I, I, I'm not going from that perspective. I just want to give you just basic things, ultimate things, ultimate things, and other things have worked out, but ultimate things, things that are practically relevant to us as believers. Now, deity, reality, deity defining realities are realities that pertain exclusively to the deity. Whenever you see that thing, whenever you see that thing, that is a marker. That the entities that possess or that operate that operation are deity. Anytime you see that thing, whenever you see those realities in the scriptures, those realities are a marker that the entities that either possess or operate those things are Godhead. You have to be God to be able to do those things or to have those things. They, they are classified into two in the context of their being, realities pertaining to their being that mark them out, and realities pertaining to their work that mark them out. Concerning their being, the ultimate reality by which deity is defined in the context of his being, his life, is eternality. That's why he is defined by that. His life is defined as the eternal life. Eternality is the ultimate defining reality. Scriptures define the God life by the word eternal. It is a the glorious life. It is a, it, it used eternal. Because that is the emphasis, that is the ultimate exclusive thing by which you can identify them. They are the eternal life. But that's about their life. Concerning their work, I've said that before, so I can move on. Concerning their work, and you see that in Romans chapter 1 verse 20, the eternal power and divinity of God here. First John 5 verse 20, this is the true God, even eternal life. Their work. In their work, there are ultimately two feats, and I've said that before, that mark the exclusive to deity. Only deity can do these things. And those two feats are creation, original creation. That act of creating out of just, where there was nothing like nothing, it was just God. To bring things that are not God out of that existence. Only God can do that. And two, salvation. Only God can save. Only God. And I have, uh, in the next place you will see the scriptures that are put there that, you know, identify these things, and are confirm these things. Now, these ultimate realities are ascribed. Now, these things, they are defined, they define God, or they are exclusive to God. These are the ultimate, there are many other things, but I just picked on the, the core, the ultimate ones. These ones, for instance, one of the reasons why only God can save, is because only God can raise the dead. When I say raise the dead, I'm not talking about bring somebody back to life, who's dead, physically back to life. I'm talking about bring a thing that has died by sin and bring it back into life. Only God can do that. Resurrection belongs only to the God class. So why did he give the strength for God to raise the dead? Did, did he say Jesus? Oh. 
Elijah raised the dead for Jesus. It's not about physical comfort. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. That's not the reason I'm talking about. I'm talking about 18 is dead in sin. And from sin, you bring it out and bring it back into life. Completely righteous, completely pure. Oh, that is that is salvation. Only God can do that. Only God can raise the dead. Because only he has immortality. Only he has incorruption. So there are other things, but I just want to focus on. I, I, want, I, I, I want something that is practical. So that you can easily identify. Only God can create and only God can save. And there are scriptures that Jesus, God literally brags about those things. He says that he says, Where are your idols? To whom you like me? I establish the end of the earth. Yeah, those are things that belong to date. If they cannot create, no spirit, nothing on that God can create. The, the creator is the most high. So all those angels, that's all those idols. They can do whatever they can do, they can do stuff, they can do miracles, even false spirits. But the creation and salvation, they can't. Because the devil is dead. The devil himself is dead. He's dead in sin and he can't save himself. So this whole thing about now, this is the beautiful thing, that these three things are ascribed to three entities in the scriptures. Three entities, these things are ascribed to them. And with the three entities, we discover them to be... So this is just a chart to explain that and to put the scriptures there. For eternality, the Father, these are the scriptures. That show that the Father is eternal. That show that the Son is eternal. That show that the Holy Ghost is eternal. This scripture here is in Hebrews 7 9 is what it says, He who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. So the Holy Ghost is called the eternal spirit. Original creation. We are told that the Father created. Here, that is the Father is the creation. Here, in the second, sorry, in this, in this second column here, we see the Son as one of the creation. Here, we see the Holy Ghost as one of creation. Let me show you just one. Uh, Job chapter 3, verse 4, to show you that it was the Holy Ghost that created. Job 3, verse 4, quickly. And here, in the context of the work, in another thing salvation, we see, sorry, we see that the Father is the one that saves here. We see that the Son is the Savior here. We see that the Holy Ghost is the Savior here. Let me focus on the Holy Ghost because we are aware of the Father and the Son. Let me just focus on the Holy Ghost and show you the scriptures that give you the Holy Ghost being these things. So Job 3, verse 4. Another person, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. Very quickly. I'll focus on the Holy Ghost. You can go into the scriptures and look at these other ones. Job 33, verse 4. If you are there, please read for me very quickly. The Spirit of God had made. He said, The Spirit of God had made me and the bread of Almighty had given me life. Did you see that? The Spirit of God had made me. So I was made by the Spirit of God. Man was created by the Spirit of God. And the breath of the Almighty has given me life. Because you can apply that in two ways. The breath of the Almighty being the Holy Ghost has given me life in the sense that He has created me. And also you can apply that as the breath of the Almighty when He breathed into our nose to the breath of the Almighty. But well, the first one is very clear. The Spirit of God has what made me. Let us make man. Do you get it now? So the Father made man. The Son, the Word made man. The Spirit also made man. He's the one responsible for manifestation and execution. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. Who is there? But we are bound to give thanks always. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you. Brethren beloved of the Lord. Brethren beloved of the Lord. Because God had from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Because God had from the beginning chosen you to salvation. How? Through sanctification of the spirit. And then believe of the truth. So you cannot be saved without the spirit. The sanctification of the spirit and the belief of the truth. So when the Holy Ghost brings the truth to you and you believe it, it's the Holy Ghost that will set you apart from sin and death by making you, by regenerating you, letting you believe. So salvation belongs to the spirit. Salvation belongs to the son. Salvation belongs to the father. Do you get that? So I'll just focus on the ones that on the Holy Ghost because these are the ones. I'm sorry I'm familiar with them. Just go through them. It will help us. Oh my God. What happened here? Alright. That's the um, the so I put the scriptures, I put dates, defining realities. So in concluding, in concluding, the Trinity is the mystery of mysteries. Yes, it's such a mystery that is beyond the scope of human comprehension. We just the possible, we, we will be discovering God forever. But that's why that it's a mystery of utmost importance because we have been called to know God. Because why is it important? Why is it important to us? Because this is it. 
if we must know God as He is, if we must know God as He is, which for us is eternal life? Because we know God is eternal life. This was one statement the Holy Ghost made to me many years ago. He said, The matter of the Trinity is not a matter of theological debate. The point is this if you must know me as I am, then you must know me as I have revealed myself. And I have revealed myself to you as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So it's not a matter whether you are arguing or not arguing. This is who I am. You can't know who I am except you know me as I have revealed myself. You must know him as he has revealed himself. And Jesus Christ, God in the person of the Son, the Word of God, has revealed the Godhead to us to be one God in three Godhead persons of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. This is the true God, even eternal life. Amen. Amen. Are you being blessed? Thank you very much. Now, we have questions. Um, my time is passing, but this is, and I really pray that. <laughs> That's been useful. <coughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, this is mission school. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, Hallelujah. Other questions? Okay. I've got other questions. Anyway. Time is gone, but uh, you can still take a question. Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, sincerely, I've been mightily blessed today. Uh, but I have just uh, two questions. Sir. Okay. My first question is uh, to, please, I would like you to uh, a bit expand on uh, the internal purpose. Mm. The internal purpose of God. Uh, I know it includes salvation, but please, I would like you to expand more on that for clear understanding. That's for my own, for my own part. Okay. And secondly, Regarding the mysteries of eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I want to ask this question in relevance to prayer, or in relevance on how to fellowship yeah. with them. Yeah. Is it that we must fellowship with the Father separately, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Because there was a time I had a confession in that aspect, okay. and I decided, okay, what I will do in the morning, I will fellowship with the Father. <laughs> in the afternoon, I will fellowship with Jesus Christ. Then before I go to bed, I will fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Okay. So I want to find out if actually, if we want to relate or communicate okay. or fellowship with them, is it with the Father separately, the Son? Because the essence of Christianity is to know, is to know God. Yeah. So to know the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, or is it that we uh, true routine prayer because Jesus Christ said that whatever you ask the Father yeah. in my name, yeah. I will do. Yeah. Is it just to fellowship with Jesus Christ through prayer in His name, or yeah. to know the Father through fellowship and prayer, the Son and the Holy Spirit distinctly um, according to their personalities? So that's my question, sir. Okay, I'll start with second question. I think let me put it this way. So remember, I said that the three the three persons of the God they are one God. What they are as God is the same thing. The, the issue of their distinction in their presence is about who they are. It's not what they are. For instance, let me give you an example. God says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? What is man? Man is the same. But you are not Elijah. You are not Brastini. You are Brother Ayodini, you are Brother Stephen. But what you are, you are both man. So I don't need to learn, look for, look at the both of you to discover man. If I want to know what their human essence, I can take you as a specimen for all men. And I'll examine your DNA, examine, and I discover things about man. I don't need to look at all men to discover, to know what man is. But if I want to know who men are, I have to interact with you differently from him because you are a different person. There's a way that humanity, that is your nature, there's a way you manifest it. That's different from the way he manifests it. So if I want to know your persons, you and your personalities, I will need to interact with you differently. But if I want to know your essence as nature, I just need to look for a man and I discover what man is. Do you know what I'm saying? Now, for the Godhead, what the Godhead has done is that they want us to know their essence. They want us to know what they are as God, which is eternal life. So what they've done is that 
they arrange their persons to provide us that knowledge. So, this is what I'm saying. So, the Father, as the person that Father has generated all things, has provided Himself to be known. But He has provided that God life to be known in the person of Jesus. So, Jesus said, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Now, but Jesus says, For you to know me, the Holy Ghost will take of mine and it will show you. So, they, they are not, you know, here, I told you that here they, they put themselves under authority and they walk in the subject. So, the Holy Ghost, so let me say this way. So, the curriculum to be known is the, the Father that means the curriculum, he will know God. That curriculum is, is put and is, is established in Christ. Then Christ now takes that curriculum and puts it in the hands of the Holy Ghost and says, Holy Ghost, from level to level, you will reveal me to them. So, for instance, the Holy Ghost comes to you now and you need to know God as the healer. That's what you need to know. The Holy Ghost knows everything that God is. But the Holy Ghost is not the one that determines the revelation you get now. The person that determines that is Jesus. So Jesus says, Holy Ghost, show him God as a healer. So you, the Holy Ghost begins to teach you. And you begin to see in the scriptures how God heals. And you begin to see Jesus healing. You begin to see the apostles through the spirit manifesting healing. You say, okay, so God heals. But the Holy Ghost knows more than that. But he doesn't reveal things to you on his own authority. He doesn't wake up one and say, I decide what you should know. It is Jesus that does that. And Jesus does that based on the Father's you know, arrangement. So what I'm trying to say is that they want you to know God. So the Father has brought it forth. Jesus is the custodian of it. The Holy Ghost is the executor of it. So now, in fellowship, which is what they have done. The Bible says that which was from the beginning, first chapter number one, that which is from the beginning, which you have heard, which you have seen, which you have looked upon, which our hands have handled signed the word of life. For the life was with the Father. And was manifested to us, and we have seen it and bear with us and shown to you that eternal life which was with the Father. That is Jesus. So the Father is eternal life, but the eternal life they give us to explore is Jesus. That eternal life was the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and, uh, and heard declare to you that you may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. So we are in fact, that's why I said that there's an emphasis on the Father and the Son. Our fellowship with Jesus and eternal life is to know the true God and Jesus Christ. We are saying, in this day, the Holy Ghost. Meanwhile, without it is the by the Holy Ghost, we know the Father and the Son. Do you understand? So, this is the point. Our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. But that fellowship with the Father and the Son is given to us by the Holy Ghost. So, it says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the container, the storehouse and revelation of all that the love of God is, so that we can come to experience and enjoy through the fellowship of the Holy Ghost. So the fellowship of the Holy Ghost brings us to come to discover the love that God has for us in the grace of Jesus. So when I'm looking at, so the Holy Ghost begins to show me Jesus. Now as the Holy Ghost is unveiling Jesus to me, I am seeing the love of God for me. Now as we begin to fellowship with them in that, we discover that the three persons are involved in every day of revelation we bring to you. So it's not as if you are going to say, oh today our fellowship will be found. Now sometimes, in your, now the Holy Ghost regulates that, in your regulation fellowship. So sometimes as your fellowship with God, the, the person that is emphasized to you that day is the Father. And sometimes as your fellowship, the person that is emphasized to you that day is the Son. Sometimes as your fellowship, the person that is emphasized to you that day is the Holy Spirit. All that is being regulated by the three of them. So sometimes they, they, they need you to know more of the Father's person and how he behaves and all that. For instance, the things I said, how did I come about them? How did I know this? It's at different times the Holy Ghost said, ah, do you know that Jesus is... Then you, you explain Jesus, Jesus, otherwise, ah, you know that the Holy Ghost is, then he moves you, then God, the Father. So he, they will be moving you around, don't worry about that. You just keep yourself in a fellowship through the Holy Ghost with the Father and the Son. So in prayer, of course, we pray to the Father. In Jesus' name, through the enablement of the Spirit. Right? But you also know that in prayer, we minister to Jesus. You know that? As they minister to the Lord and fasted, that was Jesus. So sometimes in prayer, you just want to focus on Jesus. Sometimes you want to, is this, is, you can see what I'm saying. The Holy Ghost, you know, the Bible says, all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So the Holy Ghost is the atmosphere within which you should prosecute prayer. Prayer, all manner of prayer and supplication in the Spirit. There are many dimensions of prayer. In fact, there's prayer, the one that you want to you know, that cannot be uttered. They are all prayer. So the Holy Ghost determines how we, we go through all that. But that's why, as believers, what is most important is as many as are led by the Spirit that is on the Lord. The Spirit of God has to lead our prayer life. The Spirit of God has to lead everything we are doing. The Spirit of the Lord, the, in, the, in, the, in the God, they know when it's time for you to, they need to show you more about it, the Father's person.
the Father's door. Oh, we need to show you more about the, the grace of Jesus and what he did on the cross and all that. Oh, we need to show you more about the nature of the Spirit, the personality of the Spirit, the workings of the Spirit. They know what you need to know per time. They, but, but all that is available. But they are the ones that will regulate it for you. So you just keep that basic thing where Jesus says, when you pray, say, our Father. So our focus is on the Father. We are standing in Jesus' name and we are being empowered by the Spirit to bring that forth. You understand that? Now, for the, the first question, which was the eternal purpose. First of all, that question, to answer that question, that's a whole curriculum of his own. The eternal purpose of God, because there, 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 there are so many dimensions to God's eternal purpose. But in summary, God, okay, let's read that scripture. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11. Ephesians 3, 11. Ephesians 3, 11. This, that's a very powerful question. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, let me start from verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God. Did you see that? From the beginning of the world it was hid. But before the foundation of the world it was in Christ. But at the beginning of the world it was hid in God. Alright. Who created all things by Jesus Christ. So it's clear that Jesus Christ created all things, but God created them by him. Right? To the internet now unto principalities and powers in every place by being known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose. So that operation of God to use the church to demonstrate the manifold wisdom of God to all principles and power is according to God's eternal purpose. That means in God's eternal purpose, God determined that he was going to use the church to teach the whole of creation his manifold wisdom. These were things that God determined in his he purposed it before the world began. So everything that has to do with what God decided about, what God decided he was going to accomplish, the one the man sets out on a mission. Everything God determined and decided he was going to accomplish through the annals of time and you know, eventually back to eternity is what is captured in what he calls his eternal purpose. And ultimately, what that purpose is about is revealed in 1 Corinthians 15, I think it's verse 20, is it verse 20 or 28, that God may be all in all. That's what he wants to achieve. But this is a very, very, very basic concern. This is not, because there are many dimensions of the eternal purpose of God. There is the eternal, there is the dimension of the eternal purpose of God that deals with the person of Christ, the, the Son of God, as the Christ of God. In that, there is, there is what God wants to do with the church, there is what God wants to do with creation, all those things. So God sat down and determined certain things and designed his purpose. This is what I want to achieve. But he did that in eternity. There are many aspects to it. For instance, God gave a role to angels to be part of his system to assist you as an heir of salvation. All those things were determined before the foundation of the world. God determined to make the church, to make us become partakers of the divine nature. Even though we were created around that, we were human beings, in human life. But in, before the world began, God had already sealed. He foreordained us, He foreknew us. Those, it is in the eternal purpose that all those things are. His foreknowledge, His predetermination. The destiny, He set our destiny beforehand in His eternal purpose. Our inheritance, for instance, is according to the purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus. According to the counsel of his will. To give us himself as an inheritance. You see that in Ephesians chapter 1, I think it's verse 11. Our inheritance is according to his purpose. What he predestinated us to was something he said and said, you know what? I'm going to make man a son of God. And when God thinks that, it's not just thinking, it is done in Christ. Then he now comes into time and now takes a journey. In that place too, because there, there's the purpose of God, there is the will of God in the context of his desire. There's the will of God in the context of his decision. Then there's the design. The, there's the, there's the, the, like, like an architectural blueprint that he drew out that will and how it will be accomplished from face to face. Based on that, he now began to call. Based on that, he now began to justify. Based on that, he now glory. Do you understand what I'm saying? So all those things, that whole plan, that whole place where he sits down and determines those things, that that, that context is what is called his eternal purpose. And it was purposed in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus was where. So everything he wanted to do, he, he determined it in Christ. That it is in Christ, I will justify them. It is in Christ, I will glorify them. It is in Christ, I will do the matter of creation. It is in Christ, when they sin, it is in Christ, I will redeem everything in Christ. So there's no purpose of God outside the person of Christ. Do you understand? Like I said, this is something that will be. Is here, but at least just to give the basic understanding. Ah, I don't like it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let us rise. Let us thank God for 